Hello everybody, you are listening to Three Time in Clades. My name is Albert. And I'm Joan. And we are back to do another news episode. This time we're more or less on time, uh, so that's good. Um, so we will be covering news from last month, that is June of 2023. Um, that happened to catch our eye. But before we get into that, how have you been doing since the last time we recorded? Oh, I've been pretty great. Um, really, the biggest thing to report is that I went on a small trip uh, to see my abuelos in Florida uh, since uh, the last time we recorded. Um, it was about a week trip that we took. Um, we burboed a, a nice house on a lake, um, which gave us spectacular views of the, um, well, I guess sort of the forested areas of Florida. And uh, of course, you know, Florida is an interesting place. Uh, obviously, you know, in terms of the uh, the current government situation there, uh, it's kind of a shit show. Um, but I mean, like there are still you know treasures there that you know are, are worthy of our interest and, and appreciation. No less the wildlife. I mean, it's one of the only places in North America that's subtropical, mm-hmm. um, or the continental United States, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, of course, one of the things I love doing when I'm there is you know seeing the local wildlife. Um, and you better believe that I had some really good encounters. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that later, uh, or fairly soon, I should say. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, I know I've mentioned, uh, Florida trips before on this show. So a lot of the usuals were there again, the white ibis, the glossy ibis, and hingas, um, sandhill cranes, a plenty, uh, the house where we were at actually. They had a group of four that seemed to live there. Um, it was really funny because when we first got there and were unloading things, it was in the evening time, and those four cranes were there. I think it was two adults and two juveniles. Um, and uh, they were, like, hopping around, and one was... It seemed very excitedly to grab at the um, reindeer moss coming off of the trees. And, and flapping its wings about and, and playing with the other ones. But over the days as we stayed there, that same group would kind of rotate its way around the property. Like it would show up, it would pick around in the dirt and then fly off and then come back later in the day. <laughs> and one night I finally noticed them all kind of sleeping near the lake, hmm. just outside the little gazebo area that we had. So we had, a, I guess, resident sandhill cranes that hung out there and of course my question is well how come these birds are staying here of all places mm-hmm. a lot of these houses are more or less the same their properties how they're maintained some probably have more food um in terms of that's probably the reason why they were staying <laughs> because being a verbo house you had all different kinds of families coming in and staying there and i guess they couldn't resist the temptation to feed these wild animals <laughs> to the point where our little instructions list of like you know what to do to keep things clean and organized but when we check out in it, it was scribbled on it was like it was all text but scribbled on with marker <laughs> don't feed the sand hill creams <laughs> good advice <laughs> oh yeah and like i could certainly see how persistent they would be if they've been fed constantly Mm -hmm. because some of these days we'd hear tapping on the windows it was them they would poke (laughs) at the windows and then peel at the the, at the mesh that separates the window Mm -hmm. from the outside so uh, i guess those couple times where they were being fed they they were very persistent it's like raccoons right you never want to feed raccoons um much less these birds um but of course the caveat to that was that i got some very close encounters with them from you know a relatively protected distance what i mean by that of course is that they have these big windows in the, in the back of the house and so we're sitting there on the couches like watching tv or playing checkers or whatever and like these birds would be there just a few feet away from the windows hmm. and i could like make all the details of their faces and feathers and everything like that's always so cool and they're just strutting minding their own business um they're really pretty animals i really like seeing them all the time and they're everywhere in florida i mean they're they're like herons um here in north carolina Hmm. like no matter what road you go down in the more like wetland forested areas there's going to be at least a little a little group of them every now and then um same with the white ibises Hmm. i mean they're like the pigeons of florida they're (laughs) everywhere um and uh, they're always fun to watch um but uh 
those were really my main wildlife encounters um for some of the more i guess reptilian and uh piscine of flora's inhabitants uh well that's a story that i'll have to tell coming up um <laughs> but before that uh albert how have you been well uh i mean that sounds like a really fun trip um me uh meanwhile i i don't have too much new uh that's worth reporting on the show um just working on various projects in general uh and i would say i, I I've, I've been making pretty good progress uh with with those projects um so that i'm pretty happy with but yeah not, nothing too flashy to share really hey that's always good um yeah it's always fun to hear about the projects that you work on um because no doubt we'll, we'll hear about them in time on this eventually show. <laughs> yeah um but yeah, uh, Albert is right. Uh, we have a, a, I guess, more of a proper news episode this time around where we have just one month. <laughs> so, um, although it, it's going to be slightly tweaked a little bit because <laughs> as per the the stories we wanted to choose, um, one of my stories is going to be a miniature book review. Um, of course, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, so like uh, for, for now, we have our, um, our proper news stories, papers that have been published in the last month that we want to cover. Um, but before we do that, we do have a couple of um, updates and uh, I guess natural history popular media um, pointers that we want to uh, just make sure everybody's aware of. Um, so do you want to go ahead and share some of those? Sounds good. All right, so we'll go to the next slide here. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, I, I mentioned wildlife encounters in Florida. And so I wanted to give just a brief shout out and a little, a little recollection of my time at the Tarpoon Springs Aquarium and Animal Sanctuary. So um, this is a family owned and operated aquarium since 1990, where all of the animals are rescues from various situations where they would have been much worse off. Uh, so that includes animals that were kept as pets, you know, exotics, for example, that people couldn't care for anymore or that they tried to release into the wild or animals that were wild, but they've come into human situations and contact that would have left them vulnerable and they had to have been taken care of and probably relocated otherwise. Um, so yeah, this is one of those uh, um, aquarium trips where we were looking for things to do one day and we had noticed that a lot of the zoos and aquariums that we usually like to frequent were a little bit yeah, on the pricey side nowadays than what we were used to. So we wanted to try to find something a little bit closer and more local. And we found this place. And it was a short drive away. So Tarpoon Springs, it's a coastal community in Florida, um, has a huge Greek population, which is very apparent in, in like the restaurants and some of the street names and whatnot. Uh, very neat. And uh, this little aquarium, which is about an acre in size or so, was there for us and we went and spent about an hour there um and initially i was a bit concerned because i am familiar with how some of these i guess family-owned facilities uh might lack the necessary care and qualifications to take care of some of the animals that they have mm -hmm. um, i don't want to name any names but i've, I've been to some places in the past that I look back on them now and I'm like, oh gosh, that was, that's not a good that's not a good zoo, or it's not a good place. Mm. Um, but I was happy to discover that the Tarpoon Springs Aquarium was not one of these places. In fact, it was very much up to par with the type of animals that they were caring for. So, being an aquarium and animal sanctuary uh, that takes in rescues, the majority of the animal stock are um, oceanic fishes. Um, and reptiles, uh, specifically Florida natives, or at least uh, uh, um, species that are commonly found in the in the U.S. Southeast in the, in the swampy regions. Um, and so, you go in, and they have like the two large oceanic enclosures, where they have various sharks and fish, um, and then they have a large reptile section with sliders and iguanas, and of course um, the Burmese python, uh, which is a, an invasive into Florida. And so goodness knows they had a couple of them there that no doubt were uh, owned by people who thought that pythons make good pets, <laughs> mm -hmm. or at least um, uh, novice pets, I should say. 
because obviously like, there are people that keep snakes that have you know the proper qualifications at the very least they're, they're older um but uh, i definitely want to give a shout out to one of the workers there uh, Paige conger henry who provided a very wonderful reptile feeding show and clearly showed her expertise and care with these animals again family-owned business she's been there for years and years and uh we got to witness this reptile feeding show that showcased three of their i guess more famous residents so they had a large alligator snapping turtle they had an american alligator and an american crocodile which is an endangered species and they were all named after the main trio from shrek so <laughs> it was yeah shrek the snapping turtle donkey the alligator was a female by the way um and then fiona the american crocodile <laughs> And so uh, we had a very great show. Uh, she clearly knew the natural history of these reptiles and was able to give very detailed um, information about their well-being and biology and kind of their stories, as well as being very engaging with the audience, which I appreciated. Mm. Um, so, for example, the American crocodile. Ooh, and if I remember the story correctly, that was one of those situations where um, Fiona's mother had nested in an area that was frequented by humans so she, she was where she was at she was at greater risk of disturbances in the nest and also the fact that she's a crocodile and you know people and crocodiles don't exactly go together like peas in the pod right um so uh i think the nest was broken down and the mother was removed and the eggs were confiscated and of the eggs only three of them survived two of them hatched no three of them hatched Two of them later passed away, and one was eventually found by the owners of the of the uh, Carpoon Springs Aquarium, uh, locked inside a, a Tupperware container filled with water. Oh, um, so very poor situation. So they rescued that baby and brought it to the aquarium, uh, where now she is growing healthily and eating very well. And uh, they're in the process of renovating some of the enclosures, so she's going to have a much bigger space than she already had. Um, which was about a uh, a couple meter um, square foot space that she was in, and so that, that, that's always kind of sad to hear. You know the, these stories of these animals that are um, that are kind of abused in that way. Mm -hmm. But now at this place, they have a much better chance at life, and they can educate the general public on you know what kind of reptiles there are in Florida <laughs> and what we can do to make life a little bit better for them. And so I definitely had a good time at the Tarquin Springs Aquarium. I want to give my shout out to them. Um, if you're interested, we'll put the links in the description to their homepage where you can get more information about their specific animals and, and where they are, of course. So that way you can go check them out yourself and, and give them your support. Um, yeah, Albert, do you have any comments to add? Um, I mean, obviously, I, I haven't been to this facility, but from everything you've described, it sounds really excellent, and I'm really happy to hear that you made such a good find. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like the little gems hidden away. Because, um, yeah, I, I, I've been to Harpoon Springs a couple times growing up. Um, I'd never heard of this place. Hmm. <laughs> but uh, now that I do, I'll definitely give every opportunity I can to family or friends visiting to go check them out. It's pretty great. Um, so on top of that, uh, there were also two natural history series that have recently released that we feel our viewers might be interested in checking out. Um, and one of these I have here on the, the top right, this is BBC's Earth, One Planet, Many Lives, um, which is, is kind of funny because we talked a little bit about this with some of our close friends. Uh, it's kind of an odd name mm -hmm. for your show if you want people to try to find it because <laughs> if you type in bbc earth well that's also like the bbc's brand for their nature documentary right <laughs> so, like you have to like specify what you want um but also like earth i mean it's a very very generalized title isn't mm -hmm. it you know it, it, it's not like you know the, the the formation of the earth or the history of the earth it's just earth um so like not planet earth right know, or anything like that just just earth um but I i'm sure they had their reasons for naming it the way they had um yeah so th this dropped recently um on bbc2 
um, or at least it's available to stream on the BBC iPlayer. I, I don't remember if it's aired on TV already. Um, but it's hosted by Chris Packham, who I understand is well known in natural history documentaries as a presenter, paleontologist. Um, and essentially, it is a mini series of about five episodes that talk about the interplay between geology and biology. And so doing that through the context of the history of the planet. So um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of an old History Channel show from 2007, uh, How the Earth Was Made, hmm. where it was a special and then they had a, a series of episodes where they looked at different topics in the context of geologic history. And, and this series seems to do sort of the same thing on a much smaller scale. Um, so like, I believe there's an episode about the, the Permian mass extinction event. There's one on Snowball Earth. Um, there's one about the greening of the planets, you know, the first land plants and, and oxygenation, and that sort of thing. Uh, so it seems to be pretty well covered in a lot of the sort of big events in the, in the history of the planet. Um, and they dropped a trailer. So as I understand, neither of us have watched the series yet, if mm. I'm correct in saying so. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah, so all we've seen so far is the trailer. And um, it looks really cool. Uh, I mean, yeah, the trailer shots, you, you see Snowball Earth. They have Ediacarans in one clip. Um, they show these the giant um, Silurian Devonian fungi that used to grow on the surface of the planet once upon a time. These giant uh, um, prototaxites and, and related forms that, I mean, think of a tree that's a fungus. And that's <laughs> basically what this is, just a giant fungal sprout and with goodness knows a huge mycelium underneath hmm. um, that was like one of the biggest things on land at the time, um, as well as like some Triassic reptiles, which I understand one of our good friends, Sky, had actually consulted hmm. on this series yeah. regarding some of the Triassic animals. So it's kind of fun when that kind of small world stuff happens, right? Like, oh, look, this big documentary series is on TV. One of our friends helped to make it. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's awesome. So like it looks really cool. I hope to see it soon. Um, I don't know when, when or if it'll come to America at at all. Um, so Al, you'll probably have a better chance of seeing it <laughs> yes. than I will, because um, the BBC iPlayer works in your part of the world, right? <laughs> um, so um, I'm sure once we hear more about it, we'll let you all know about it. Um, but what I have been able to see um, is the new Netflix series. Our Planet 2, hmm. which is shown here in the, the bottom right, these wonderful um, penguins. Uh, so Our Planet, the original, aired a couple of years ago on Netflix. It was part of this new programming slot that they've been trying to do to bring natural history documentaries of a BBC quality to you know the streaming service, hmm. which seems to make simultaneously great and terrible decisions it doesn't seem to know what it wants to be <laughs> right. um, but i will say that our planet as a series is generally pretty good um there are a couple things here and there that i know are iffy about the show um in terms if, if you're interested in like how much in a nature documentary is real quote unquote and and, and which is kind of edited to make it to make a coherent story um, I know our planet has suffered from that sort of situation regarding a, a sequence of walruses, um, which I mean, that's, a, that's another story we can get into at another time. Um, but overall, like the, the footage is about as best as you can get. It's a David Attenborough narrated series um, with some very spectacular footage. So the original our planet was about biomes, right? They did the whole, oh, it is an episode on jungles and deserts and blah, blah, blah. That we're pretty used to with these recent um, BBC series, but Our Planet 2, um, which is four episodes only, um, focused on animal migrations. And of course, that's migration in the very widest sense, just simply the movement of animals uh, from their home range to another place and then back, depending on the seasons or resource availability or what have you, um, which makes it for a very interesting niche subject. Um, I'm certainly not used to documentaries about migrations uh, beyond, say, some of the earlier ones, like the winged migration or um, 
uh, nature's great events mm -hmm. or nature's greatest events. I, I forget what it's called. But that was another one that had several episodes with migrations. Um, but this one is definitely more broad. And so it included everything from uh, the travels of honeybees to new nests and kind of showing how that process works where the individual bees scope out a nest hole. Then they come back, do a little waggle dancing, and then the other bees go and confirm whether that hole is actually viable for the nest or not, which is some very interesting cognition, mm -hmm. um, to the travels of army ants. So there's a sequence with army ants in the Amazon where they were moving their entire colony to a new nest, including dragging the queen along, um, which is always, and all the larvae with them, which is always fun. Um, two things like the lace and albatross, um, which is a very famous case study now, uh, being these seabirds that live in a polluted environment where there's just plastic everywhere and kind of how they navigate sailing from their island to become like true oceanic birds where they have to navigate you know being suffocated to death with plastics and with tiger sharks that <laughs> like to swim up and grab the birds as they sit on the water which is very harrowing if you can get through both of those um to yeah like, let's see there was there was a really cool sequence with um with uh, orcas so they have the gray whales which is a, another um of the baleen whales these big ones that have uh, the the uh uh tubercles on their heads they're, they're kind of like um they're kind of bumpy looking really neat um but of course they, they migrate uh, across the pacific and this particular pair had to travel through monterey bay which is kind of a, a dangerous spot for those types of whales because orcas will come in and using their pack hunting abilities take down the babies for food um so that's that's always interesting to see in a nature documentary um but one of my favorites that i didn't even really know about either it, it was I, either i saw it on the news and i forgot about it or i just did not see it in the wave of news that we are bombarded with all the time <laughs> Um, but apparently just a couple of years ago during COVID time, um, there was a population of China's uh, Yunnan elephants. Hmm. So these are um, Asian elephants, some of the last ones that live in China, because um, they had a much wider distribution in the past. And this was a small herd. And there was a drought where they were. And so they had to go and find, you know, a new place to eat, you know, while the drought subsided. And of course, you know, in this uh, modern world, where there are cities and towns and farmlands everywhere, that meant that these elephants traveled through all of these urban areas and into the cities. And what was kind of neat to hear was that, you know, the, the Chinese government and, you know, the locals kind of let this happen. Hmm. Like they, they knew that this was kind of a risky situation. You know, the elephants were already rare in China to begin with. So wherever they went, they just kind of stepped aside or even left out you know, left their crops unattended so the, the elephants could eat when they needed to. And they follow these elephants through this huge trek, many kilometers, till they reached the city. And, like, there were, like, police barricades and stuff mm. set up so the elephants could cross the roads and there'd be no accidents. Um, but eventually, like, they got as far as they could and there was really, like, nowhere else they could go from that point. So they had to turn back and go back to where they came from. Oh. <laughs> which, you know, thankfully, the drought had subsided and now there were green plants back home again so the elephants ended up being fine um but it was a really interesting situation because it really puts into perspective kind of the 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 the, the world that a lot of these animals are in now mm -hmm. you know back in the past before widespread human settlements like that you know the earth was dominated by migrating herds animals could travel to and fro and, and enter new lands and cross oceans uninhibited that was really their 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 the world was their stage really to kind of go where they needed to depending on the seasons and you know human beings have kind of messed with that significantly because i mean can you just imagine being a herd of elephants trying to cross a city hmm. like there's so many factors into that that are just almost impossible to deal with uh and so for a lot of other species, no doubt it's the, the situations are even worse. They're, they're not as lucky to get that kind of support. 
Um, so it really puts into perspective kind of like what migration means nowadays mm -hmm. for, for wild animals, whether that's birds or insects or elephants. Um, and so I think overall, uh, our planet too did a very good job of highlighting these factors. And, and I would argue as a documentary series, I liked it more than the first Our Planet, mm. which is already pretty good. Right. But that one was definitely Netflix's like opening up into this mm -hmm. field, right? Like it's a very standard nature documentary. They, they, they show the biomes and they show like representative animals and what's going on. And they do pay a lot of service to like conservation and, and the environmental crisis more so than some of the more recent ones that I have seen. But like, since they've been making more documentaries since then, um, I think they're just going to have to get better and better in quality. Mm -hmm. And our planet too, certainly demonstrates that. Um, so those are my thoughts on those two series. Um, Albert, I, I feel like you probably haven't seen Our Planet 2 either. I um, have not yet. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been too busy to, to really check much, uh, either of these out. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do know they both exist um, and uh, have seen the, uh, the trailers slash previews for them. And, and they definitely look interesting. I, I would say, uh, as far as Our Planet 2 goes, I, I agree with you on the, on the first one. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was pretty good, uh, not without issues, but uh, I, I think it was o overall quite well done. But, but, you're, but you're right, yeah, it, it does kind of follow the sort of nature documentary formula that we've grown used to uh, regarding this type of series, at least, uh, this type of format. Um, so I, I was pretty surprised to see how they kind of changed the theme uh, quite a bit for uh, Our Planet 2 and instead had it focus on migrations, um, which is a very different approach, but it sounds, sounds like it's a, it's a good one um, based on your comments and others um, that I've heard. Uh, and in, in a way, I, I think that's a, that's a pretty good kind of alternative approach to uh, this kind of um, series because of course the, the limitation of doing episodes by biome is that uh, like yeah I'm sure you can fudge things a little bit but each episode is more or less focused on a single biome but many organisms are not necessarily limited to just that one biome right in many cases they move a lot between different ones and so that, that's exactly the kind of behavior or event that a series like this can showcase when it is focused more on the movements uh, and behaviors of the animals themselves. So yeah, that's, uh, that, that's pretty intriguing. Um, and I, I do look forward to, to seeing these eventually. I, I do intend to at some point, but um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not very good at keeping uh, current when, when it comes to when it comes to media but yeah I, I i would probably will will eventually get around to it oh sure yeah um no i definitely recommend both of them um so for any of you who uh are have access to like the bbc iplayer or netflix uh, i definitely would encourage checking these out um i'm sure that would be a large part of our audience would be able to see these um you know what would be cool for i mean if you want to do a if you want to do a natural history series using the biome approach I would pick one species or like a group of species, a closely related species, mm. and kind of follow each of their members in different biomes mm -hmm. to see how like the same species or group of species responds to different environmental factors. Right. Yeah. So like, I mean, I don't know how feasible this would be nowadays considering how rare some of these animals are, but like right. wolves, mm -hmm. like do a series on wolves and you have like the timber wolf and the Arctic wolf and the Indian wolf and like the, the um, uh, wolves in uh, the Middle East. And like you can see how one species responds to different biomes right. in their own ways. And you kind of show some of the local wildlife as well. And uh, I think that could be an interesting way to do this. Um, yeah, I, I, don't I, know if this, <laughs> yeah I, don't, I don't know if such a series already exists. Um, I'm learning about nature documentaries that I haven't seen every day. So. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't be surprised, but I think that would be a, a different approach. Um, and of course, the appeal would be like the, the subject material itself. I mean, if you like, if you, if you did do the wolf example, I mean, people like wolves, <laughs> and uh, they probably don't even know that there are wolves in India or or in the Arctic, for example. It, it could be a good learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. But that, that, that's just me. Um, so those are basically our, our main shout outs for today. Um, uh, Albert, if you don't have anything else to add, uh, we can move on to uh, my first story. 
All right. <laughs> yeah. So, and of course, uh, my first story here on this slide um, is a review. Um, yeah, I, I've decided to forgo one of my new story slots instead uh, to review this book that I just read because I felt that it was a very important book and one that I highly encourage others to check out for themselves. So, uh, in particular, this is The Unnatural History of the Sea uh, by Kawum Roberts. This was published in 2007 by Island Press. Now, uh, I have Roberts pictured here to the left. Uh, he's a marine biologist and conservationist from the UK who has had a decades-long career in the natural history and preservation of the oceans. So he's been associated with the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, which has been working to temporarily end deep sea mining just to allow the recovery of those, uh, of those habitats, uh, and with the Blue Marine Foundation, of which he is the chief scientific advisor. Um, and you know, speaking of natural history filmmaking, he was the main scientific advisor on Blue Planet 2, oh, cool. <laughs> all the way back in 2017. So he's got a pretty wide range. Um, and so this is one of three books that he has published. And this was alerted to my attention by our friend, Dr. Darren Nash, uh, quite a couple of years back. Um, it was during one of the Ted Zoo podcast episodes that uh, he had briefly mentioned he was reading it. And he gave a little bit of a small description of what it was about. Um, and of course, I was immediately intrigued. I thought it was a neat idea for a book and I wanted to check it out. So it had been on my wish list for many years <laughs> before I finally was able to purchase it last year. And it was only within the last few weeks, including while I was in Florida, that I decided to finally read it. Um, you know, that's the nice thing about books. You know, they're patient. <laughs> um, so the particular subject of the book is one that I'm sure will speak to most of our viewers. Uh, that is the rapid defaunation of the oceans at the hands of human overfishing. We had discussed this aspect of anthropogenic change in the last episode of Humanity, a prologue, where we briefly outlined aspects of harm done to the oceans in our admittedly incomplete survey of the environmental crisis. And having finally read Robert's book, I not only have a greater understanding of the situation we've been placed in, but I've also gained a realization of just how much we've already lost. Mm -hmm. And it is significantly more than I could have even imagined. Um, so for now, I want to highlight the main points and findings of the book, kind of give my overall impressions and thoughts, and then I'll open things up to you, Al, uh, to discuss some of these things. So one of the key themes of the book that Roberts discusses is shifting baselines. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea that our conception of normal nature or a given environment like the ocean is fundamentally flawed because we were born in a time after such dramatic changes have occurred and we have no frame of reference for those changes. Mm -hmm. We're born and we think that the world around us is or was perfect and then we witness more changes to the environment and we lament those losses but if we only look at the evidence or read past accounts we learn that what we considered normal was actually far from that and, and these ideas shift over the generations to the point where there's an overall social or societal amnesia if you want to call it that that prevents us from seeing how things should truly be and have been in the past and this creates problems for conservation movements because it means that without the benefit of knowledge, of that knowledge, we'd be trying to restore environments that we thought were pristine or in fact emptied and defaced centuries ago. And this is where the book really shines. Roberts investigates two periods of anthropogenic change, looking at historical fishing records, the old accounts from explorers and captains, and pirates, uh, archaeological sites and, and then some and he shows that the oceans were a far more abundant and rich place than we today could even have imagined hmm. and he shows how we got to where we are now and admittedly it's a very bitter and rough story to get through if you're passionate about these things so that first period begins in medieval europe around the 11th century a.d 
uh, which is where he places the origins of intensive fishing. So it seems that after clearing their forests and then damming, overfishing, and polluting their lakes and rivers, Europeans began to turn to the oceans for their sources of fish. Fish were already highly valued and seen as prestigious food. Um, and as Christians, they needed a source of protein for the days of the year where they couldn't eat livestock. Mm. The technology for sea and ocean fishing likely came from the Norse, who had the ability to fish for deep ocean species like cod and haddock from the North Atlantic. Now, this combined with an increased demand for fish because of the environmental destruction they had already done, mm. that pushed various nations out into the oceans for food and establishing trade routes and further increasing the demand for the massive species they were finding that could feed families. And that attitude uh, was carried to the Americas during the age of colonization and the intensive practices of long distance fishing combined with the particular greed of commercial capitalism began to have very quick effects on the Caribbean seas and waters um, off Eastern North America. So all throughout this time, you have these reports and logs that detail enormous quantities of fish and other marine life. Uh, some species at sizes very rarely seen nowadays uh, or at distributions no longer found today. So just to list some of these, like you have huge colonies of walrus off Nova Scotia. Hmm. You had beluga whales swimming as far south as Boston. You had the great auk and its hmm. associated swarms of seabirds. Um, you had porpoises in freshwater lakes in the North Carolina Sound. You had five and a half meter long sturgeons that weighed 800 kilograms and could be caught over 600 strong in just a day with hooks over a space of 2.3 kilometers. You had herring and shad that were so numerous that they were that there was more fish than water, <laughs> that some people describe. Um, Caribbean waters, they teemed with so many turtles that ships could run aground on their shells. Wow. Um, there were so many sharks that they repeatedly interrupted fishing lines to the point where the sailors considered it warfare to deal with them. Um, to say nothing of the whales, uh, which are considered by Robert as the first global industry, as whalers of many nations poured out over the Atlantic and Pacific oceans and just slaughtered so many species that we really almost lost them all. Um, Actually, to say that we almost lost them all would be a bit of an understatement. Um, so this was particularly damning for me. Uh, recent genetic studies, and this is from the time of the book's publication, um, had revealed that the estimates by the International Whaling Commission of previous you know, pre-whaling numbers for whale species were widely off the mark. So rather than the estimates of, say, humpback whales and fin whales, in the North Atlantic during the early 17th century, being at 20,000 and 30 to 50,000 respectively, that new research found that there was probably actually something on the order of 240 million and 360 million respectively. And in the current numbers for 20, 2007, um, for those species are at nine to 12,000 humpbacks and 56,000 fin whales. So if you can compare those former estimates with these newer estimates for past numbers, you know, far from having recovered from whaling, as some of these organizations have proposed, these animals have seen an over 99% decrease in numbers. Hmm. And I think that's frankly horrifying, you know, to think that people have wiped out hundreds of millions of whales in a relatively short period of time and that story is the same for so many different marine animals you know people would find them in such abundance that they just took and took and they left no restrictions on fishing mm -hmm. to the point that once common species like these had severely reduced to the point of rarity and of course it just got better you know with, with the invention of trawling which is also mm -hmm. medieval during the 14th century and its story, as told by Roberts, is very frustrating because you have these repeated instances of people being initially very hostile to the trawlers because they knew and saw very quickly how effective they were emptying sea stocks. And as trawling continued to advance to the 17th and 18th centuries, its killing power was greatly expanded and accompanied by drift netting and long line fishing. And uh, the oceans just suffered even more. Um, now, of course, for those of you 
um, who need a refresher, uh, ocean trawling is where you take a big net and you drag it along the seafloor. So it just catches anything that's swimming or nesting there. And that process can basically uproot these long established ecosystems of marine invertebrates and fish and basically leave a place that's, you know, barren and, mm-hmm. and, and, and dead, essentially. It's like taking a big hook and just reeling out a bit of a garden. And that's basically what trawling is. And it, it's recovery is often very slow and it, it almost never is what it was in the past because some of these organisms that have been living there, um, it took millennia to get to that point. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's, it, there's slow ecosystems to grow. Um, so then Robert's coverage of the second period of ocean deafination is considered the era of modern industrial fishing, when the steamship allowed for greater fishing power and at a further range into the deeper parts of the ocean because the continental shelves were starting to be extinguished. Um, now, the attitudes presented in this book are very startling for this period of time, as at the time, people were convinced, even after all of this you know, effort that had been taken to essentially clear the oceans, you know, people still thought that the ocean was inexhaustible. Hmm. You had old-time fishers who had voiced their concerns about the loss of fish stocks, and they were blatantly ignored. And you even had marine scientists who were parroting the same ideas that the ocean could never be overfished. Um, for example, uh, Rachel, Rachel Carson, who some of you may know for her 1963 book, Silent Spring, she was one of these, at least, initial voices. And she wrote a book in 1951 called The Sea Around Us, um, which urged fishers and buyers to diversify their palate to prevent overfishing of certain species, which, of course, was one factor that helped lead to those other diverse species to then become overfished. Um, and in the book, Roberts also highlights the varied ways that ocean ecosystems have struggled to adapt to this rapid defaunation. Mm-hmm. And there was one really interesting case um, where he hypothesizes that the current behaviors of the orca as a hunter of seals and fish was likely shaped in response to the effects of whaling. Hmm. So he used various sources and research that had been done by marine biologists to suggest that whales formed the primary diet of orcas once upon a time. But as these larger food sources were extinguished, they began to shift their diets from the, 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 of course, the carcasses of the whales that were being killed uh, to then smaller marine mammals and fish and squid, ultimately driving them into conflict with people who saw them as competitors in the fishing stocks and then advocated for their own slaughter. Hmm. Um, now, it's a very interesting, if controversial, hypothesis. Um, but so far, I haven't been able to find any recent studies from the time that the book was published that really have supported or denied it. Hmm. Um, but I think the way that it's presented in the book, it makes it, makes it seem very plausible. Um, and certainly, like that doesn't mean that orcas have stopped killing whales nowadays. I mean, I just talked about that on our planet, too, (laughs) with with gray whales. Um, And, of course, there there have been many that have been documented in scientific literature, uh, including the largest of all animals, the blue whale, is not immune from these attacks. Um, Just remarkable information there. (laughs) Um, But anywho, uh, the book continues to show how Europe's own seas were emptied during the early decades of the 20th century and how this was being increasingly made obvious by new research and observation. Uh, So some nations like Britain had passed acts which set minimums on fishing. Um, But of course, the fishing industries responded by simply moving to more distant waters. Um, And so you had more and more trawlers scraping the ocean floor. And so cutting away enormous populations and communities of mollusks, corals, worms, and crustaceans that had grown over millennia. And so the book now begins to document the collapse of fish stocks one by one and shows just how quick that process can be. So in one example, uh, the herring fishery off East Anglia was one of the first to go in 1955 after supplying food for over a thousand years. And then across the 60s and 70s, more and more herring stocks collapsed until a moratorium had to be called as it was discovered that herring had been overfished by 70% in the North Sea. 
And so when the herring fishery finally reopened in 1981, those catch quotas were never the same. And on and on it goes, whether it be cod fishing off Canada and New England uh, or Totaba and abalones off California. And so by the end of this section of the book, Roberts describes how the last great wilderness of the very deep oceans, you know, even they could not escape the onslaught of overfishing and trawling with their technological advancements, showing areas that had not that had not even been scientifically explored were already destroyed by the time scientists got there. So they had no idea like what it was like beforehand. Um, you know, what species had not been described by science that had been lost before they even knew that they were there. And so Roberts rather gloomily states that, you know, these revolutions in fishing technology were and are ticking time bombs that hasten the declines of marine life and leave no winners for the seas or for people. Um, but of course, rather than end on that note, Roberts does make a bold case over several chapters on what can be done to prevent further losses. And it's here where he really outlines his own suggestions for the reinvention of fishery management, which includes a significant reduction in the amount of fishing, the elimination of catch quotas, and decision making by politicians who are unversed in marine science. Uh, and the requirement of fishers to keep and use everything that they catch, as so much of the killed collections by trawling are often just dumped back into the sea. Hmm. Um, one of the most important suggestions on top of these is the creation of marine reserves, and many more of them. And as the results of these reserves, where fishing is outright banned, have clearly shown time and again that they are effective in boosting fish numbers and increasing diversity. But right now, there are too little of these, and the estimates by marine scientists argue that anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of all the oceans should be protected in this way in order to give it a fighting chance. Um, and so we end on a rather optimistic note with Roberts hoping that the ultimate fate of his book is that it becomes a curiosity at used bookstores in the future where people reading it will kind of shake their heads in disbelief that we, we almost got to that point of <laughs> <laughs> destroying all of the oceans um so overall you know I, I did find this book to be really engaging it was well written heavily researched um i had some recollection of this idea that the ocean was much grander than we could have you know believed mm -hmm. uh, and that was mainly helped by uh, uh incidentally a small blurb from a history channel show life after people where one of the talking heads mentions these historic accounts of a bountiful sea um, so to finally read about it directly and, and see the numbers for myself was very worthwhile after all these mm. years. Um, certainly very helpful in my understanding of the past. Um, now, admittedly, one of the downsides of this book is its age. Mm -hmm. This work is 16 years old, and we've learned a lot more since then. And a lot of that mainly concerns the current threats to the ocean. Mm. Um, so this was written at a time, for example, when coral bleaching yeah. was not understood to be a serious issue. Um, now, the destruction of coral reefs is mentioned in the book, but that is never described anywhere. Um, or that they don't, this is before uh, the domino effects of anthropogenic climate changes were fully understood. Like Robert successes climate change in the book, but he never factors it as a possible barrier to the health of the marine reserves that he proposes. Mm. Um, so those were, you know, notable missing areas that would have made this work even better and more complete than it was. Um, now, of course, <laughs> I've since learned after reading this book that Roberts himself wrote another in 2013 called The Ocean of Life, mm. where he recapitulates what he wrote in Unnatural History and then continues into the present to address those very concerns <laughs> I just raised. <laughs> So, yeah, maybe then I'm due to read that book. <laughs> and, uh, our viewers could consider acquiring both works and reading them together if they so choose, you know, as one can get a full understanding of the ocean's current situation. Um, because otherwise, like, Unnatural History is still a very great book. Mm -hmm. uh, I still highly encourage people to check it out, if anything, for those historical anecdotes, um, which make up the majority of the book. Um, and the coverage is... is, is fairly broad because like it's it's about overfishing but 
it's not just about fish. Like you get whales, you get pinnipeds, you get a lot of time with marine invertebrates um, and, and sea turtles. So it's a broad scope of ocean life. It's not just the fish mm. and sharks. Um, so it's very, um, it has a good, it has a good oh, uh, zoological scope, I guess you could call it. Um, but yeah, uh, th this, this current situation of the ocean is very serious. And it's honestly very heartbreaking to me to know kind of what was taken from us through greed and carelessness before we were even born. I mean, I would have loved to live in a world with hundreds of millions of whales and <laughs> clouds of seabirds and vast shoals of sharks and other fishes and a sea floor covered in invertebrates. Um, and I can only hope that we can find the will to create a world where we can have that again. Mm -hmm. um, but as the book demonstrates time and again, I, I did have to kind of recognize that that would take time and quite a lot of time mm -hmm. for those stocks to boost again. So I, I myself might not get to enjoy it if we do so. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly future generations will. And that's a, a bit difficult to grasp for me. Um, yeah, Albert, I, I'd love to hear your input on this. I mean, uh, I, I haven't read this book, but given what you've said, um, it sounds like a very eye-opening and in some ways kind of chilling read. Um, but as you said, it's about a very important subject uh, that is still very much of concern today. Um, so it seems to me that, yeah, I think uh, more people should be encouraged to, to read this book. Um, and I probably will be putting it on my infinitely long <laughs> reading list. Um, so we'll, we'll see, we'll see uh, when, when I get to that. But um, it definitely sounds like a very, very good book, uh, very, very worthwhile. And you, you did touch on something that I, I was wondering which is, um, as you mentioned, the, the age of the book, because, yeah, like you said, this book is well over a decade old, so I, I would be very curious about what the state of things are now relative to when it was written. Um, like, how much worse has it gotten? Um, and has anything gotten better? You know, I, I, uh, I, that, that's definitely something I would be very interested in. Um, and so it, it is um, quite... Uh, fortuitous that, that you mentioned that uh, the author has written a sort of update, as it were, to to this book. So I I, I definitely am interested in checking that one out too. Um, I guess I I, I can't comment uh, much further without without actually having read it. But I do think that this is a, a book that's well worth introducing to to our listeners if they haven't uh, read it yet. Um, and I'm very glad that you uh, you decided to do so in this episode. Oh, I'm glad to do so. Um... Yeah, I certainly agree with you. Um, but at the same time, like I, I do, kind of like talking about older books anyway. <laughs> um, if anything, just for for the the value of the knowledge that they've added in the past, mm. and it, those kind of like perspectives of then and now are always interesting to me. Yeah. Um, even when it comes to like books like this, because like I mean, two thousand seven, like, yeah, sixteen years ago, like that's a long time for me. Um, so it, it it's an old book, but it's also not because, like, I mean, I I still remember like living in two thousand seven. Yeah, and, 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 <laughs> like that that perspective is um is always kind of strange, right? Like you think it's like my dad always says, like whenever I say the other day, it's either yesterday or twenty years from ago. <laughs> you know, that, that, that sort of um, <laughs> the sort of mentality. Um, but certainly, like the big appeal to me is the historical information. Like that, at least, um, I mean, barring arche like new archaeological studies or maybe like finding new manuscripts that have been haven't been translated, um, that doesn't really age mm -hmm. um, a lot. That, that's still fairly valuable uh, to know, because um, clearly, like when I read about like world history, and it, it's very easy for like the typical accounts to kind of gloss over, like the oceans, right? Mm -hmm. Like they talk about like, oh, uh, this, this, this. Spaniard or this Englishman sailed from here to here, um, without really, without really mentioning kind of like what the state of the environment he was sailing through <laughs> was like, right? 
because clearly like when Columbus and Cook and um, Sir Walter Raleigh and all these folks were, were cruising around, um, as the book demonstrates, I mean, the oceans would have been almost unrecognizable today, hmm. um, given their abundance and diversity and, and distribution. Um, and it's interesting to compare that to like deeper time periods that we've talked about. Obviously, like on uh, Dinosaurs, the second chapter, we talked about how in relatively recent times, in the Pleistocene at least, um, you know, North America had so many different types of birds of prey mm -hmm. and water birds. And even in like historic times with the diversity of North American birds that was alive then, mm -hmm. like that was just peanuts compared to, you know, a couple thousand years before. Right. Uh, <laughs> And so to kind of compare those perspectives to the oceans, who again, you know, they, they seem so vast. And like, how, how could it be that humans have had such an impact? And it's like, well, hmm. there's the evidence right there. It, it's all laid very clearly in the book. Um, it, it seems no part of the earth is spared from intense anthropogenic activity. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like that, that, that's an important lesson to take away, I think. Um, so yeah, definitely. I I, um, I highly encourage uh, checking out Colin Roberts' work. Um, we will definitely post links to not only this book but to the, the newer one as well. Um, and who knows? Maybe you know down the line, I, I will acquire uh, Roberts' newer book, Ocean of Life, and I'll I'll read it for myself and I'll give my thoughts as well. <laughs> um, because uh, as I understand it from like the, the descriptions that I read, it not only updates information in this book it actually extends the timeline even further back mm, interesting. so it's like a history of you know the oceans throughout like the life cycle of our species right mm. so it, it goes into deep time so it's kind of like the ultimate update to this book <laughs> um, and i'm sure he'll probably recount a lot of the information here already um about whaling and, and the collapse of fisheries for example and the inventions and the inventions that have facilitated that um so yeah, we will definitely let you know about that. Um, but yeah, unnatural history of the sea. That's all I have to say for now. Um, if you have if you have anything else you want to add, we can move on to your your first story. Uh, sure, we can do that. <laughs> all right then. So I'll be doing more of a, a standard uh, set of news stories. Well, which is what I usually do, I guess. <laughs> I, I don't usually deviate from the formula very much, but. That's not to say these stories aren't interesting, because uh, I think they're very interesting. Um, so our first story is going to be one about plants. Uh, so that's, I, I don't know, pretty cool, I would say. Um, it's, uh, it's, always, it's always nice to be able to kind of dip our toes into the, the botanical realm a little bit. Uh, we've certainly talked about on the show um, the phenomenon of plant blindness, uh, people just being generally less familiar with plants in general, and that's certainly true of me personally. But um, this study on plants definitely did catch my eye for several reasons. And uh, obviously, I, it is something I, I do want to get better at. So I, I think uh, this is a pretty good opportunity to do so. Uh, so this study covers a group of plants called the cycads, and it studies their phylogeny and evolution. So right away, uh, you might be reminded of um, the study we discussed last episode in the last news episode about butterflies, which they really did a big uh, kind of phylogenetic uh, tree of butterflies, um, or they reconstructed the phylogenetic tree of butterflies and uh, tried to figure out what that could tell us about their evolution over time. Um, and so this study did something very similar with the cycads. So, uh, what are cycads anyway? Well, uh, cycads are a group of gymnosperm plants, um, so so-called naked seed plants, and that makes them relatively close relatives to things like conifers, uh, which are also gymnosperms. And most cycads grow as trees, essentially, um, and today they are known from, you know, couple hundred species or so, uh, primarily found in tropical and subtropical regions. They look quite a lot like a different group of trees that people also tend to associate with the tropics. Uh, those are the palm trees. Um, 
However, they're not closely related to palm trees. Palm trees are flowering plants, angiosperms, um, whereas cycads are gymnosperms. So they kind of have a superficially similar appearance, but that is convergent evolution. Um, so some of the things that make cycads and palm trees look pretty similar um, are that uh, in both groups, the leaves grow from the top of the tree, um, and as the tree grows, they kind of fall off as uh, closer to the base. And so you have this kind of bare trunk uh, for most of the tree's height and a big cluster of leaves on top. And furthermore, uh, most cycads don't have kind of major branches coming off of like the, the bottom of the trunk, for example. It's, it's not like, um, you know, a typical conifer where you have uh, branches all along the trunk, e even close to the base. Uh, like think, think of it, what a typical Christmas tree is shaped like. Um, instead, uh, you have this kind of very bare trunk um, and the leaves on top. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what most cycads look like. Um, in fact, there are some types of cycads that are kind of colloquially called sago palms, um, which is very confusing, uh, not only because they're not actually palm trees, but also because there are actual palms that are also called sago palms. So uh, that's one of those uh, things with common names that you can't really trust. Um, but you know, it kind of goes to show how, how similar those two groups are. Now, a few kind of... Uh, Notable characteristics of cycads, they have what are called coralloid roots. Um, so these roots are basically like these relatively short and, and thick and stubby roots. Uh, and they're called coralloid because they kind of shape, they're kind of shaped like what you would think a, a coral is shaped, like a typical coral. Of course, coral actually comes in all kinds of different shapes, uh, but like compared to what you might think of as a typical root, which tend to be very long and thin, like you have these kind of relatively stumpy looking roots. And the main function of these coralloid roots and cycads is to uh, kind of provide a home for symbiotic bacteria, uh, which is pretty interesting. So these bacteria um, help cycads obtain some of the nutrients that they need um, and also produce some types of toxins that help the cycads protect themselves uh, from animals that might want to eat them. Um, and speaking of which, uh, cycads are also notable for uh, producing a particular group of toxins that uh, is unique to them, um, which uh, is apparently a very effective insecticide. Uh, so it's a way to prevent insects, especially from kind of chomping on their leaves and so on. So plants and insects uh, often have a very complicated relationship with each other. Um, and as we'll sh we shall see, uh, cycads do also have other types of ecological interactions with insects. Now, cycads uh, are one of those groups of plants that have separate male and female individuals. Um, so in some types of plants, uh, a single individual plant can have both male and female reproductive parts, essentially. Uh, but in cycads, they have uh, kind of separate male and female trees. Um, and so this is what is called a dioecious. The, the pollen of cycads is primarily dispersed uh, by beetles. So they have a very um, kind of strong mutualistic relationship with some types of beetles that are specialized for pollinating uh, cycads. Um, and this is also related to something we talked about in the last episode, isn't it? Because we discussed the evolutionary history of planted insect um, uh, mutualism, specifically uh, pollination mm -hmm. over time. And well, as we just see, cycads are a very ancient group. And so this kind of relationship uh, almost certainly would have been going on uh, for a very, very long time, has gone on for a very long time. Now, even though uh, cycads are poisonous overall, uh, something interesting about them is that their seeds, uh, when they when they mature, uh, have a kind of fleshy outer coat that is not poisonous. And so this is something that actually entices animals to come and eat those, um, the, the fleshy outer covering of those seeds. Uh, so it turns out that cycads uh, are one of the groups of plants that rely on animals uh, primarily to disperse their seeds, uh, although some species uh, also uh, disperse by water um, and also by gravity, although it is said that by gravity it is not a very effective 
way of dispersal because the seed can't really land very far away from the parent plant. Um, but it seems that uh, dispersal by animals is, is something that most of them are quite specialized for. And so they grow this edible fleshy outer coat to entice animals to come and take those uh, those seeds away with the with the fleshy coat around them, uh, and hopefully when the animal is done eating the the outer coat, uh, it will drop the seed somewhere uh, where it can hopefully grow. Cycads are very well known in the fossil record, so even though they are relatively you know restricted in their distribution today, they were uh, much more diverse. Uh, in the past and much more widespread in the past as well. So fossils of cycads have been found pretty much all over the world. And we know there are many, many different species in the distant past. Now, because a lot of these fossil cycads look pretty similar to the modern ones, a kind of cliche has been that, well, cycads are one of these quote-unquote living fossils. They've been mm. around basically unchanged for millions and millions of years um, and they've just been kind of doing the same thing they've always been doing um, and in fact uh, there's also this perception that they are kind of this old group that couldn't really keep up with the times as it were and that's why they've gone through this decline today um, it has often been postulated that well maybe uh the large dinosaurs uh, were used to be the primary seed dispersers of cycads, uh, but since the big dinosaurs were wiped out at the end of the Cretaceous, uh, kind of cycads lost kind of their main partners in their in their ecological relationships and went through a major decline because of that. Or it has also been suggested that maybe cycads couldn't really compete with the flowering plants. So as flowering plants became more diverse. Um, uh, through the Cretaceous and through the Cenozoic, uh, cycads declined in turn because they, they couldn't keep up with them. Um, and so there's there, there's this kind of perception that cycads are this kind of, these uh, unchanged relics uh, from the past. Um, but how true is that really? And so that, that's kind of one of the things that this new study touches on. Um, so this study uh, was done by Mario Corio and, and colleagues. Um, and Mario Corio is uh, one of our uh, main supporters <laughs> of our podcast. Um, so I'm very excited to, to be able to cover this, this new study by him. Um, some, something that uh, makes this study different from the butterfly study we discussed in the, uh, in the last episode is that whereas in the last episode, uh, the butterfly study only looked at genetic data from modern species of butterflies and used that to reconstruct their phylogeny, uh, which is great and a huge undertaking. Um, but this study on cycads uh, was not limited only to living species of cycads, uh, but instead uh, it took genetic data from living cycads, but uh, also combined that data with morphological data from the leaves of both living and fossil cycads, uh, because after all, uh, these fossils in the deep past aren't going to preserve any DNA, so we can't use genetics on them. Um, mm -hmm. And by combining genetic and morphological data, uh, the aim was to kind of create a more complete picture of cycad evolution through deep time. And so they made a number of very important uh, findings, uh, and some of them were pretty unexpected. So first of all, they found that most of the fossil cycads that were included in this study were probably not modern type members of either of the two main living cycad groups. So the two living cycad groups are the Cycadaceae and the Zamiaceae, which you can see labeled on the figure here. So uh, kind of the, the main differences from my kind of brief background research uh, is, is that in the Psychodaceans, the female reproductive structures do not form cones. Um, so the cones are only found in males. Uh, whereas in the Zamiaceans, both sexes form cones, and in fact, those cones can be very large and woody cones. So they, yeah, they actually have a sort of woody um, kind of texture uh, to them. Um, 
So that, that seems to be one of the major kind of differences between these two different lineages. Uh, but it turns out that most of the fossil cycads that were included in the study uh, were not extinct members of like the, the modern uh, groups uh, of, of either of these lineages. Instead, most of them were either stem psychodacians, so you know they're they're closer to psychodacians than to zamiacians, but they they don't belong in like the, the modern group of psychodacians, um, or vice versa. They might be stem zamiacians, uh, but you know they're they're not in the modern group of zamiacians proper. So, uh, what does this mean? Well, uh, one of the major implications of this is that we probably shouldn't assume that what's true of modern cycads is automatically true of many of these extinct types of cycads. So in terms of things like habitat preferences or, or how they grew or what they looked like um, or what kind of ecological um, interactions they might have had with other organisms in their habitat, uh, oftentimes it seems that uh, we can't automatically assume that what was going on uh, with them is going to be the same as modern cycads, even if they might look superficially morphologically similar. So I think that's a, that's a pretty good uh, note of caution um, regarding um, how we depict these extinct cycads. Um, now, uh, something especially intriguing is that the study found evidence of a completely extinct but very diverse and long-lived group of cycads um, on the stem of Psychodaceae. Uh, so these would be stem Psychodaceans, but not modern Psychodaceans. Um, and so this group, uh, this extinct group, uh, the authors do not formally name, uh, so they don't give it a, a formal uh, kind of collective name, but in the paper they refer to it as the tennis clade uh, after one of the genera um, that, that it includes. And so the tennis clade uh, appears to have existed from the Triassic all the way into the Neogene, so that's quite recent. So they, they existed all the way, I think, into the Miocene. We're within the range of, say, like 15 million years ago, there was still uh, the, this extinct group of cycads present. Uh, however, there aren't any around left anymore. So there's, there's this kind of, um, kind of hidden diversity uh, of cycads uh, that was around for the probably pretty much the entire Mesozoic and much of the Cenozoic that we would have completely missed if we had only looked at uh, living groups of cycads. Uh, now, to be fair, the authors do mention that the kind of statistical support, like the, um, the weight of evidence that actually supports all of these, uh, all of these extinct forms as a clade it's not particularly strong, so it's possible that not all of them actually form this clade together. Uh, but even so, it seems like the best supported um, phylogeny that they were able to get from the study uh, does suggest that there there was like a, a group uh, in some shape or form uh, like this that was in the distant past um, and you know has no living representatives. So that is a pretty notable finding. Uh, from this uh, from this phylogeny uh, with the information uh, from both kind of evolutionary rates of the characters they included, the genetic and morphological characters they included, uh, as well as the ages of the fossils they included, uh, they were able to estimate how old cycads might actually be. And so it seems that cycads in general, cycads as a group, uh, appear to have originated during the Carboniferous, um, which is consistent with the known, known fossil record. And what's especially interesting is that they also tried to estimate kind of the biogeographic history of cycads. So uh, where did cycads live over time and how, how have those ranges changed um, over uh, these millions of years? And so they estimated that cycads originated during the Carboniferous in what would become Eurasia. So this would be in the northern hemisphere. Um, at this point, the world's landmasses would have been united as the supercontinent Pangaea. Um, with the northern half being called Laurasia and the southern half being called Gondwana. Uh, so it's thought that uh, based on this study, cycads originated in Laurasia uh, during the Carboniferous. But for a long time, 
it seems that various mountain ranges across Pangaea uh, prevented cycads from dispersing beyond uh, this region. And it was only in the Mesozoic that they started kind of getting to other parts of the world. Uh, of course, plants typically can't, you know, individual plants typically can't physically move around. So it's not like these cycads were getting up and walking to different places. Um, the way that plants disperse is via kind of reproduction, essentially. So as, as their seeds disperse to new locations, uh, their, the species range kind of shifts over time, right? And so uh, it seems that during the Mesozoic, that was when cycads started uh, dispersing into other land masses. Um, and eventually they kind of managed to make it to all of the world's continents, um, especially members of both the extinct tennis clade as well as the still living uh, Zamiaceans, um, dispersing quite widely around the world. Uh, something noteworthy about these biogeographic patterns is, is that it seems Greenland and Antarctica were very important uh, in the evolutionary history of cycads when it comes to this type of dispersal. So uh, as the cycads originated in what would become Eurasia, um, they eventually probably reached what would become the Americas via what is now Greenland. Um, and then from there, uh, from the Americas, they probably got into several of the uh, southern hemisphere continents uh, via Antarctica. And so both of these uh, regions were major corridors for cycads in the uh, distant past. Of course, nowadays, Greenland and Antarctica uh, are very cold and are not really <laughs> suitable habitats for cycads anymore. Um, and so they no longer have cycads living on them today, and cycads can no longer use them as kind of dispersal routes. But uh, in the distant past, when the climate was much warmer, that was probably, uh, those were probably kind of major uh, centers of dispersal uh, for cycads. Uh, and related to that is that the restriction of cycads to low latitudes based on this study probably occurred at the end of the Paleogene and into the Mid-Miocene. Um, and so it seems that this phenomenon, the restriction of cycads to kind of uh, regions close to the equator, uh, was probably not the direct result of competition with flowering plants or the loss of large dinosaurs, um, because it doesn't really correlate uh, in terms of timing with either of those events. Um, instead, it correlates a lot better with kind of climatic cooling over the Cenozoic, uh, which makes a lot of sense because it seems that cycads were adapted to primarily warm environments, and as the climate got cooler and drier over the Cenozoic, uh, continuing to today, um, less and less suitable kind of habitat would have been available to the cycads and cause their uh, distributions to shrink towards low latitudes. Now, uh, it is very hard to reject the possibility that uh, there might also be kind of other factors at play, though maybe maybe there is some competition with the angiosperms, for example. But it does seem like in terms of what evidence we actually have, it does not suggest that uh, this was a major driver of kind of the modern pattern of how many cycads there are and where they live. Now, this is a very interesting pattern to me, uh, because if you follow Dinosaurs the Second Chapter, we actually talked about the same pattern, uh, not in plants, but in birds over time. Uh, so there are many groups of birds today that are restricted to the tropics, uh, but we know during the Paleogene, um, like 50 to 40 million years ago, uh, there were all kinds of um, birds that were around in North America and Eurasia uh, that definitely would not be found anywhere uh, on those land masses today. Um, and so uh, the timing also is very similar because we see over time uh, these birds disappear from these higher latitude regions and until they get to the kind of present day distribution that they have. And so we see these, these parallels between birds and other organisms. Um, regarding how the climate has affected the distribution of organisms in the present day.
So all of that is a lot of good information about Psycat evolution, and it strongly suggests that we shouldn't be thinking of Psycats as relics of the Mesozoic, um, considering how recently a lot of these modern groups uh, originated, um, as well as the fact that many of these fossil groups do not actually belong to the, to the modern groups, um, and the fact that there is no strong evidence that they were, you know, um, kind of being driven out by other groups of organisms. And uh, this study also emphasizes kind of the value of fossils in this kind of study, uh, because it turns out if they didn't include the data on fossils um, in their study, it would have been a lot harder to narrow down what was the likely kind of uh, regions of origination for cycads in general, as well as the different cycad groups. So the information from the fossils uh, kind of really helped uh, plug in a lot of these knowledge gaps, as it were. And this was true even if you uh, don't assume that places where we haven't found fossils um, were places where those species were absent. So that, that's never a safe assumption to make, right? Uh, just because we haven't found fossils somewhere doesn't mean that they didn't exist in, because there are a lot of factors that go into whether something gets fossilized. Um, but even if they kind of left it ambiguous whether or not certain fossil species existed on the land masses where they haven't been found, the addition of fossils still allowed us to narrow down um, kind of the distribution of cycads in ancient times. And so clearly uh, fossils are very important for this kind of biogeographic history. And that is also a point I made in Dinosaurs, the second chapter regarding those bird groups, where if you only looked at the modern species, you would have a very misleading view of where these groups actually originated. Um, and so uh, that is a pretty brief summary, uh, well, um, relatively speaking, of the major findings of the study. It's, a, as you can tell, a very large scale study covering a lot of ground. Uh, so there are a lot of details that I've had to leave out. But um, it was you know, a pretty interesting look at this uh, um, long lasting group of plants. Um, do you have anything to comment on regarding the study? <laughs> well, I, I'll definitely admit that I was myself a bit surprised about the results of this paper. Mm -hmm. um, of course, granted, I uh, I am not well versed in plant evolution as I would like to be. Um, but my general impression about cycads um, was not necessarily that they were living fossils, of course, because even, even I knew that among all the different types of animals and plants that are called living fossils, that almost never seems to be the case. <laughs> and, and it really obscures a lot of their you know, their past history, you know, everything from coelacanths to twitaras, you know, have changed just as much as every other organism. Um, I, I never liked the idea that something looks prehistoric mm -hmm. because technically that's most life on this earth <laughs> right now. <laughs> life today has, has a fairly decent prehistory. Um, but what I was surprised about was that like none of these living groups had a very deep pedigree, I mm -hmm. guess to say. That most of these were, were Cenozoic in origin. Um, that really surprised me, to be honest. I thought that mm -hmm. there would be at least a couple that probably have a long line, but I guess with this particular type of study, that, that, that's kind of put a, an axe to that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very curious how they were able to combine the morphological and genetic data, because I, I'm not exactly familiar with how closely like the leaves of plants mirror their evolutionary history mm -hmm. um besides like you know being adapted to climate for example right um so as you mentioned like they combined the the, the morphological data from the leaves mm -hmm. of, of the fossils and living cycads and that's how they helped uh, build their tree um i'm curious as how difficult that is um because uh i would imagine with fossil plants because you're not finding whole organisms the majority of the time right which i guess you could also argue that for many animal groups <laughs> um i would imagine like kind of trying to pry those details of evolutionary history and relationships might be a bit tricky um but of course I, I know it's been done before it's just it's just an area that i'm not familiar with um but i mean like this this is incredibly impressive um i mean yeah it, it is just like the butterfly study it you know being able to answer these questions of biogeography and and dispersal over time using a phylogenetic approach um but just the fact that they use it for like a plant group such as this mm -hmm. is incredible um and it is very revealing 
um, kind of the, what roles geography plays in the distribution of organisms over time um, and, and how something that seems you know almost trivial like say like the formation of a mountain range can actually have such, such wide-ranging effects mm -hmm. to where it would prevent the dispersal of these groups <laughs> um because i'm just thinking giving the timing wise like that, that's probably referring to the the early appalachians i would think mm. um along with others because the, the appalachians are are, are pre-mesozoic yeah and, and they formed from the collision of the continents that produced pangea and at the time they were like some of the most impressive mountains on the planet mm -hmm. um so the of course me living near the appalachians i it, it's interesting to contemplate these things you know as they once were because now of course the appalachians given you know 300 plus million years <laughs> of time they, they have been whittled down significantly um they, they are a shell of their former self um and uh but just to know that, that they're so old you know like so it's just it's just incredible it's fascinating mm -hmm. um to see how like that has affected the distribution evolution of groups like cycads so um no i definitely agree that this was a remarkable paper and uh i'm kind of hoping that we see more and more and more of these you know fairly soon yeah because <laughs> i kind of want to see like w what results come out for certain groups yeah mm. um, especially plants because it seems like if if this approach is going to work very well for any group of organisms where the data is very poor like plants and invertebrates mm -hmm. Or at least like insects and arthropods like those would be pretty good groups where we have a pretty decent fossil record but we're not we're not you know we're not finding as complete specimens as we would like mm -hmm. in a lot of cases um, i think that's going to be a really big driver in helping to understand these groups even better yeah mm -hmm. and then compare that to like previous studies that have attempted to hypothesize these relationships um, this was a very good paper Rob. <laughs> yeah I, I definitely enjoyed reading it um and yeah you're you're right um some something something that's uh, that's notable is that well uh, old mountains are low cuz uh, they get they get eroded over time uh, whereas mountains that have been freshly built up they're the, the tall ones they're they're relatively young um that's uh, that's definitely something that, that that was impressed on me in my uh, when I was studying for my geology degree um and as for your question uh, about kind of how how informative the kind of leaf characters are uh, when it comes to uh, plant phylogeny. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not a botanist, so I, I don't really have a good handle on that specifically, but I would imagine one of the reasons they decide to focus on leaves specifically is that, first of all, they're, they're one of the most commonly preserved parts of, of plants, um, and also because of the uh, the problem you mentioned, where plant fossils are often not the entire organism. Uh, so there are some quote-unquote species that are only known from leaves, and then some that are known from, you know, roots, and then some known from the trunk, or uh, and so on and so forth. And so they probably wanted to kind of eliminate that kind of uncertainty by only focusing on the leaves in this case. Um, and so they do mention in the paper that, yeah, they, they weren't able to include some species of fossil cycads that are known from other parts, uh, which would be pretty valuable to include, but it's kind of difficult uh, because it's kind of hard to compare um, when you are you have different taxa uh, that are known from completely different uh, body parts, uh, and in some cases may even actually be the same uh, taxonomic thing. Uh, it's just difficult to tell with, with plants especially. Um, but uh, this, uh, this definitely is a, a very promising approach for understanding the um, uh, evolutionary history of many different groups of organisms. And I, I myself have done this kind of study with, with birds, for example. Um, and so I definitely look forward to seeing more of this uh, with other groups. And yes, it would be especially fascinating to see it done with more types of plants, especially. Oh, yeah. Um... Well, I guess if, if there's nothing else you have to add, um, we can move on to my next story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now, um, I guess I should say that this is my first and only new story today because <laughs> I did a review earlier. Um, but uh, I picked a story covering horse evolution. Uh, more specifically, a study on how the foot and hoof of horses developed over time. Um, but I figured this would also be a good opportunity to provide a brief overview 
of the story of horses for our viewers. So horses are very familiar today, and traditionally paleontologists have understood that their evolutionary history was very familiar as well. Hmm. Uh, views of the history of horses, or equidae, to use their clade name, uh, were of a simple series of progressions from small browsing forms that lived in forests to gradually larger grazing forms out in the grasslands, until we approached something like the modern horse. Now, this schematic was repeatedly displayed in museum exhibits and popular books for over a century, and was used as an early example of evolution, as shown by the fossil record. Uh, in particular, Thomas Henry Huxley, so-called Darwin's bulldog, was struck by Othniel Charles' Marsh's um, fossil collections on a trip to America in 1876, where they had a near-perfect sequence of fossils that outline how horses evolved in North America. Now, since that time, however, we've accumulated so many more fossils mm -hmm. that this simplistic linear evolution, which is misleading and almost goal-oriented, was wrong. You know, if we wish to follow the history of modern horses in the genus Equus, we can see these subtle trends, but they are not the whole story. Uh, instead, horses have radiated and diversified into numerous lineages with varying characteristics and behaviors. And many of these did not contribute to the evolution of Equus, nor did they survive to the present day. So uh, the clade Equidae arose sometime around 50 million years ago during the early Eocene, sharing a common ancestor with a now extinct clade called Paleotheridae. In the beginning, there was little to distinguish the two. They were short, generalized mammals that fed on low-growing brows with ridged molar teeth and stood on four hoofed feet in front, three in back. In fact, this common ancestry has led to confusion in the past for paleontologists and for the general public. So if you grew up from the 80s and 90s and back, and you picked up a book on prehistoric animals, you'll likely read a statement in the vein of, Hyracotherium was the earliest horse, mm -hmm. or Eohippus was the earliest horse. And if the book was a little bit more scholarly, you might read that the two animals were synonymous with each other, and that Eohippus was a name that was no longer used. Well, this situation has since been clarified with new research. Hyracotherium, it turned out in 1989, was not a horse, but a member of that sister group. It was a paleothier. And the paleotheres were solely animals of Europe and not of North America, where true horses originated. So the name Hyracotherium could no longer be used for the North American fossils that were once called Eohippus. And by the early 2000s, that name was revitalized and is now considered valid again, but with a caveat. For Eohippus, had been a bit of an umbrella name for a number of different fossils that are now all considered different genera today. So Eohippus represents just two species out of many. Um, so from this split into the clade Equidae, uh, we begin first of all with a series of forms related to Eohippus, which had good long legs for running through the underbrush of the humid Eocene forests. Uh, but beyond these features, there was little that implicated their later ancestry to modern horses. Uh, in fact, there's probably a little reason for paleo artists, past and present, to depict these animals as simply dog-sized horses. For all we know, they may have looked more like small forest deer or, or chevrotains, for example. Mm -hmm. um, in any case, other types of horses emerged with more streamlined bodies and adaptations for leaping. These include forms like Orohippus, which is illustrated here at the top left. Uh, that were otherwise little different from their ancestors. By the Middle Eocene, so about 45 million years ago, the diversity of horses had reduced somewhat, but they were still relatively common animals. It's during the late Eocene to the start of the Oligocene, so around 40 to 30 million years ago, that horses underwent a major split into two clades, the Anchitherines and the Equines. Now, the former group, uh, though now extinct, had a very good run. They lasted all the way until the Pliocene. Uh, but the key difference between them and the equines 
was that they mostly remained browsing animals mm -hmm. even as the great grasslands of the world began to emerge during the Miocene epoch. Uh, fossil forms include Mesohippus and Parahippus, and there is even evidence of one genus in particular, Meohippus, that began to adapt to a grassland grazing existence only to revert back to forest browsing <laughs> as the earlier Eohippus-like forms died out and thus left a vacant niche that seemed better for them than competing with the equines, and many of them even shrunk in size to their former um, scales. Now, the molars of Ankytherines had low crowns, but they did share with equines the modern feature of the tooth gap, or the interdental space between the front and the back teeth. Um, so if you're a horseback rider today, that's where the horse bit attaches. Uh, and significantly, they had also begun to reduce their digits. Ankytherines and the early equines lost their fifth digit on their front feet, which is reduced to a vestigial bump, and so now only stood on three toes in back and front. The Ankytherines, in the form of Sinohippus, also made the first horse expansion out of North America and into Eurasia, which played some role into their late survival. Now, the early equines, which includes Acritohippus, which is illustrated here at the bottom left, um, and Merychippus, <laughs> who had no knowledge of December holidays, hmm. um, increased in speciation uh, and specialization in response to the expanding grassland ecosystems. Uh, it was here where horses first evolved high crowned teeth to help deal with the gradual wearing down of enamel that happens when you eat grass all the time, as grass contains uh, silicon bits as a protective feature. Uh, to better move around in the open, and perhaps more efficiently, horses also began to change the shape of their foot, with the middle toe, or digit three, growing in size, while the remaining digits two and four reduced in length to the point where they sometimes never made contact with the ground. Based on the scale of distribution for some forms like Mary Chippus, it seems reasonable to hypothesize that herding and galloping behaviors also developed at this time in response to increased predation by the newly evolved pack hunters like dogs. And these behaviors would have certainly given the North American plains a feeling straight out of the Serengeti. Um, there's one site in Nebraska around 12 million years ago that was densely packed with horses, representing 12 different species all living in the same place. Mm -hmm. Now, just as before, the equines experienced another large split uh, between 17 to 15 million years ago during the early Miocene. This was between the Hipparionines and the Equini. Now, the Hipparions, which includes Hipparion itself, um, which displays uh, an important role in my new story in a little bit. Um, they had subtle differences in their skulls and teeth that set them apart from the equini, and they also represented another instance of horse expansion out of North America and into Eurasia. In this case, they traveled very far. Uh, for genera like Hipparion, made it all the way to Africa and Europe. Uh, some forms became the smallest miniature pony. Uh, Nanippus only stood about a meter tall. And this expansion also did this group good. Uh, they lasted until the early Pleistocene, meaning that early members of Homo encountered them. Now, the Equani, uh, however, would end up being the only survivors out of the entire horse dynasty, and the one that would end up having the largest global impact. Early forms of these include Pliohippus and Dinohippus, which were now much larger and standing solely on their middle toes. The two remaining digits were now significantly reduced, and in some species could no longer be seen outside the skin of the limb. Our modern genus Equus emerged around 5 million years ago during the early Pliocene, and itself diversified into many disparate forms across North America. But even at this time, it was not alone among horses. Uh, one line of Equini, uh, the genus Hippidion, had migrated into South America alongside one species of Equus during the Great American Biotic Interchange and likely helped push out the native ungulates who had been there for tens of millions of years. Equus itself, of course, also broke out into Eurasia in a move that ultimately saved the genus from extinction, as by the end of the Pleistocene, Homo sapiens had spread around the world mm. and eventually entered the Americas, where their impact killed off the last members of Equus there, who were not used to a human presence before. And so today, the genus is survived by roughly seven species, including three species of zebras, 
throughout the southeastern half of Africa, uh, three species of asses in northern Africa and southwest Asia into um, Central Asia, uh, and the horse proper, Equus ferris. It was this species that we domesticated around 5,000 years ago on the Central Asian steppes, uh, with the donkey, or Equus africanus, uh, being domesticated in East Africa over 7,000 years ago. And of course, uh, these equines were effectively reintroduced into North and South America in a full circle recovery of the genus, who today encompasses over 309,000 feral individuals in North America alone. Um, for comparison, the numbers of domesticated horses and asses in the entire world are 60 million and 40 million, respectively, performing functions both work and play related. Um, so this that's a rather whirlwind tour of horse evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, Albert, do you have anything to add or comment on before I continue? Oh, um, not much, uh, but I, I'm certainly familiar with the, the classic model of horse evolution. It was definitely everywhere in, in uh, popular media and science communication um, growing up. Um, so, yeah, a, a real classic example of the, the information about evolutionary histories we can get from the fossil record. Um, and it's always interesting to see it being refined further, as I'm sure we shall see. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's jump to the next slide now. We'll get on to our actual story. Um, and now that you all have that in the back of your minds, um, we can turn to this paper by Alan R. Vincelet and colleagues who were interested in horse evolution from the perspective of the foot. So technically, living horses are mesozonic, meaning that the structure of the foot is centered on the middle digit, which supports all the weight. As I've just explained, we know from the fossil record how the other digits became reduced and lost over time in horse evolution, with digit three and its hoof taking priority and growing in size as the animals became more adapted for galloping in an open grassland environment. Um, digit five, then digits two and four shrunk in size and were absorbed into the foot bones, becoming known as splints. But curiously, there has been a question in recent literature, which I had no idea this was a thing until I actually read this paper, <laughs> Um, that suggests that maybe this model is not entirely correct. Underneath the outer thickened keratin nail of the hoof is the frog, or the V-shaped part of the hoof that touches the ground. And you can see this illustrated in the small image below, which shows the underside of the hoof from a, uh, a skeletal perspective. As understood, this shape of the frog represents a key feature seen only in the genus Equus and nowhere else in other hoofed mammals. So this is contrasted by the cloven hoofed artiodactyls, like deer and cattle, who have their hooves formed from a fusion of two digits. But what if the supposedly monodactyl frog was also formed from a fusion of digits? And rather than being absorbed above the larger middle toe, digits two and four actually contributed to the formation of the frog itself. So this was a relatively recent proposal mm -hmm. that was first argued in a January 2018 paper by Nikos Soulunius and colleagues, who examined a series of Hipparion trackways from the Laetole site of Tanzania <laughs> around 3.8 to 3.6 million years ago. And yes, this is the same Laetoli site where footprints from Australopiths had been uncovered, but they were accompanied by many other animal trackways from guinea fowl to elephants. Um, now, a bit of a technical correction. Um, I'm finally mentioning Hipparion, and this is the name used in this paper that I'm covering. Hmm. But in recent years, those particular remains in this time and place have actually been reclassified into a new but related genus called Urinathohippus. Um, so just to get the specifics out of the way, um, when I say Hipparion, I mean that particular genus. Um, I don't know why the authors decided to stick with Hipparion anyway, just, I guess, formality's sake. Hmm. Um, uh, so the 2018 team had examined the Laetoli trackways and argued that they found evidence that the hoof of Hipparion was actually formed just from a singular enlarged digit three, but incorporated the long lost digits one and five to create a padded frog. 
And so in their side analyses of horse fetuses, the team also argued that the living equus hooves were similar, with the frog being formed from digits two and four overlaid by the larger digit three. All this is to say that then horses could no longer be considered monodactyl ungulate <laughs> instead of having a single hoof made from several fused digits, uh, which is certainly interesting from the traditional explanation that we're so used to. So here's where Alan R. Vincelet and colleagues came in. Uh, they wanted to simply test that hypothesis by examining much of the same evidence as the earlier team to see if they could replicate their observations. And this included going back to those like Tole prints, matching these up with other horse trackways, as well as taking measurements of these and of horse fossils for added measure. And they also looked at some of the literature documenting the development process of horse embryos in a more complete fashion to see just how they emerge from the womb with their um, anatomical development. And so I guess long story short, they failed to replicate the earlier results. Hmm. Um, so regarding the embryos, the team noted that although a developing horse starts with a five-toed foot and retains but the most proximal portions of these, those digits are not retained in any way that would imply they contribute to the formation of the hoof. At roughly 45 to 55 days of development, the hoof is formed, including the frog, but at no point is there any evidence of digits two and four being present. The frog, it turns out, is simply the anterior of the heel bulb of digit three, which is a feature only seen in horses and thus considered a specialized trait of that group. There is no differentiation or subdivisions here that imply aid from the other digits in its formation. Now, regarding the Laetoli tracks, the team determined that the peculiar shape of the prints did not suggest that the hoof of Hipparion included remnants of digits one and five, and were instead impressions of the vestigial digits two and four, which are shared with the early equines and retained in the Hipparion lineage. That these features have remained in this clade for so long suggests that they were at least functional to a degree. And indeed the authors here reference biomechanical studies on tridactyl horses who have birth defects that allow them to kind of regain those lost digits that suggests that even these diminutive toes could assist in load bearing hmm. or joint stabilization yeah. or even aid in direction changing when they're running. Now, given that fossils show horses having sizable vestigial digits like these between 20 to 5 million years ago, that would be telling. Um, and so what about that padded frog? that the team suggested from the uh, the earlier they totally track ways. Well, the team failed to find that either. Instead, they argued that those track ways show horses pressing their hooves at an angle into otherwise soft ground, which creates the illusion of a pad where none actually exists. So these Hipparion were probably dragging their feet or slightly sinking into the ground as they walked which would make sense given research showing that the Vitoli trackways formed in volcanic ash, as we discussed in one of the earlier episodes of Humanity, a prologue regarding the hominin prints. Um, now, fun fact, foot pads are known in horses, but only in trackways from the earliest types, like Orohippus with its multi-toed feet. Now, these would have been similar to the feet of tapirs, which is another type of odd-toed hoofed mammal that is related to horses, and also rhinos, which makes up the three living groups, uh, who then could be considered as retaining the ancestral condition of the foot. Um, but this was clearly shown not to be the case in later horses like Hipparion. So that means that horses lost this feature very early in their history as their feet changed. So alas, a novel hypothesis was tested and failed. The frog of the horse is formed from a single digit, number three, and the other digits were indeed reabsorbed into the foot and did not contribute to movement by the time the genus Equus emerged. But like, that's just an important aspect of science. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes ideas, even those contrary to long established information should be examined in a critical light 
because you never know if they may reveal something that has not been noticed by anyone else before. And then that gets us even closer to truly understanding an aspect of the natural world, mm -hmm. in this case, force evolution, um, which is certainly no stranger to long established ideas being overturned. Uh, you may recall, after all, how for over a century we viewed the story of horses as a simple straight line and not the dynamic family tree we know it is today. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, even animals as common as horses can surprise us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's all I have to say about this paper. Um, it seems like a very niche subject, but <laughs> it just really fascinated me at, at, at just the fact that we could even have these novel ideas to begin with of animals that we think we know this evolution so well. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. What do you think? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, that, that actually reminds me that when, when I was younger, I, I remember borrowing a book from the library, though. It was a children's book um, about obscure mammals. And I think it was titled something like, Have You Ever Heard of an Aardwolf? Something like that. Ooh. And each page was basically posing the question, have you heard of this some obscure mammal? Um, <laughs> and uh, they would, it would be accompanied with an illustration of, of these obscure mammals on, on each one, on each spread. And at the very end of the book, there were um, like kind of more detailed paragraphs about each of these different types of mammals um, with information about their biology and so on, uh, which I, I, I had a lot of fun reading when I was little. However, uh, what's relevant to this study or, or the story um, is that after kind of, you know, introducing the reader to a bunch of these obscure mammals that they probably haven't heard of, the last page ended on, have you ever heard of a horse? Well, of course. And of course, there was an illustration of a horse there, too. Um, but in the kind of ending matter with, with the more detailed info at the back of the book, the authors did point out that, yeah, well, horses, everybody is familiar with, but they are actually very weird animals when you, when you get to know them and you, when you really dig down into their biology. And so that definitely echoes what you just said. Um, and yeah, the, I, I think this is a really interesting study too for very similar reasons. And um, uh, some, something that um, particularly struck me was that uh, I, I, do, I do remember hearing about the 2018 study you mentioned that proposed uh, the other digits of, of horses was act was actually incorporated into into the hoof. Um, I I remember hearing about it and I I was very intrigued um, and I really wanted to hear what other researchers who studied horse evolution thought. Um, so I'm really happy to see this new study come out and actually test those ideas because yeah uh, I I definitely do think it is worth re-examining long held assumptions. Um, and sometimes those assumptions turn out to be correct, uh, and sometimes they don't. Um, so in, in this case, it seems that the traditional model was, was closer to the truth, um, which is really good information to know. And yeah, the, the, the previous study, um, it, did, it did enter my head that you know, it, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And so I, I, I'm very glad that another team of authors has come and kind of re-examine those same lines of evidence to uh, see whether or not uh, this hypothesis could be upheld. Um, I guess the, the last thing that comes to mind uh, is that one of the authors on this paper is Christine Janis, who have, we have mentioned before on the show. In fact, we, we covered a paper that she was the first author on uh, in the previous news episode. We were doing a lot of connections to the last episode in this one, it seems. Um, but, but anyways, I, I bring that up because um, I, here's, a, here's a fun fact, is that I know Christine Janis owns a plushie of an Enchitherium. Uh, so that is one of those three-toed browsing horses that you mentioned, Enchitherium. Um, so uh, that that's a, that that's pretty fun. Um, I, I've seen it before in person. It's a it's a very cute plushie, um, and yes, it does it does have like the three toes on on each foot. Um, so uh, just a, just a little bit of a fun trivia to 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 end <laughs> to end this on, um, and that's about what I have to say about that. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. I love obscure plush toys. Mm -hmm. I think they fill a very sizable market. <laughs> and uh, 
whenever I go to like a new museum or zoo and I see one of those that excites me, I have to grab it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, I have a couple, I have a little collection of stuff, which is kind of fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, I agree. I mean, that that's always, um, it's always something important to keep in mind that a lot of these traditional ideas that have just had the staying power, you know, have we exhausted all possibilities of testing them? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's always, a, it's always good to really just make sure we've covered all of our bases um, on certain things. Now, of course, like that's different from, you know, having clear widespread multifaceted established evidence for some phenomena and then having kind of your own crackpot <laughs> ideas. Um, <laughs> that you know are questioning that um two different processes that are happening here <laughs> right um uh but no that this is a really great example of i guess science in action mm -hmm. as it should be yep. mm -hmm. um it's a really well-rounded study a lot of great um references and just the level of detail that they used in breaking down the earlier papers points uh, was very admirable mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. they left no stone unturned um uh, in that older paper uh, even as far as to like dig up their own literature to supplement and expand what the original authors had done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so like it's, it's, I, I don't know if you call this like published peer review um, in and of itself, like not so much peer review of an earlier paper, but right. like, Hey, we're not only did we peer review your paper, but we wrote an entire thing showing <laughs> you <laughs> why this research is a bit suspect. Right. Um, right. It made a couple of mistakes here and there. But otherwise, the spirit was there. Um, <laughs> I don't know if, what is the term for that um, correction. Um, but no, it, it's it's a remarkable paper, and, and I'm pleased for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, even if it doesn't really, you know, fail to validate a novel hypothesis, it's still an important contribution mm -hmm. to the fossil mammal literature. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, but that's all I have to say about this paper. Um, shall we jump on to your final story? Yeah, sounds good. And it will be the final story of this episode overall. Um, so this study is about a giant gecko, which uh, should be a fun one. Um, <laughs> so uh, we've talked about lizards on the show before, but I, I don't think we've done a story on geckos specifically um, but they're a really fun group of lizards <laughs> um, now there are many different types of geckos there are over 2,000 different species and new ones are being discovered all the time um, and for some perspective there are currently thought to be over 10,000 species of lizards in general uh, and, and we're, we're talking about all squamates here as, as lizards so in, including things like snakes um, and the so-called worm lizards um, so the geckos uh, represent a pretty large fraction of, of that diversity and they have a lot of really interesting and distinctive features uh, many of them lack eyelids so uh, they can't blink uh, but instead, what they will do to clean their eyes is they'll often lick them. <laughs> so you can find a lot of video footage of, of, of geckos kind of licking their own eyes. Uh, and that's because, well, they can't blink. Um, many species are nocturnal. Uh, they're active at night, which is pretty different from how many other types of lizards are. Um, in fact, be because of this, the, many of them have very big eyes, uh, so which makes them look pretty cute, <laughs> I, I happen to think. Um, uh, they have very good night vision. And they're often very vocal as well, which is also pretty unusual for lizards. Uh, of course, we, we did talk quite recently uh, about, a, about a study that um, found that the ability to vocalize is actually quite widespread in vertebrates, far more than has been traditionally appreciated. But even so, um, the vocal abilities of geckos have kind of long been recognized um, and are very obvious. Uh, they kind of squeak and, and chirp and peep and do all kinds of interesting noises. Um, so in, in fact, um, when I visit my family in Taiwan, uh, sometimes we do have geckos wandering into our, our living spaces, into our like apartment buildings. Uh, and sometimes at night, you, you'll be able to hear them kind of squeaking away on, on the walls and such. Um, so they, <laughs> they, uh, th this is a very well-known behavior that, that they have. Um, something uh, that uh, geckos are very well-known for is that most of them uh, have these pads on the feet that help them 
uh, climb. And in fact, they are very good at climbing. They can climb straight up vertical surfaces. Um, and these, uh, these pads are quite interesting. Um, if you think about uh, how to stick to a surface, uh, of course, one of the most intuitive ways of doing that would be to maybe secrete a sticky substance and then uh, be able to stick there, or, you know, secrete some kind of fluid to help you do that. And that's basically what tree frogs do, for example. So tree frogs uh, have these pads on their fingers and toes, and uh, the way they work is that they, they secrete a bit of fluid uh, that kind of helps them attach to, to substrates. Um, but in geckos, uh, their toe pads do not secrete a substance like that um, for adhesion. Uh, instead, uh, they use a type of dry adhesion. And the way that it actually works has um, been the subject of a lot of study over the years uh, because people are very interested in finding out how can we make adhesives that are similar to geckos. Because uh, um, first of all, they, they don't require any sticky fluid to work. Um, and furthermore, uh, gecko toe pads are actually self-cleaning. Uh, so if you can have like a self-cleaning sticky thing that doesn't leave behind a sticky residue, I'm sure you can find all kinds of interesting uses for that. And so people are very interested in figuring out exactly what causes geckos to stick. Um, and it turns out that a lot of the traditional ideas for how this works is actually incorrect. Uh, the, one of the traditional ideas um, for what causes the stickiness of, of gecko toe pads is that they primarily work using a type of uh, force called uh, van der Waals uh, attraction forces. Um, and if you if you look at like you know uh, popular books and such, uh, many of them will will mention this. Uh, however, in more recent studies, studies seem to suggest that this is incorrect. That uh, primarily the main force that helps geckos um, use their toe pads to attach to things is that is um, electrostatic forces. So it's a form like static electricity kind of attracting their toes uh, to surfaces. Mm. Now, I, I'm not enough of a, I don't know, uh, a physicist to, to explain to you in detail how, how this actually works. Uh, but it is a quite, a quite a remarkable adaptation. Um, and the structure of these toe pads, what they consist of is on, on the underside of each of these toe pads, there are a lot of tiny little bristles that cover cover the, the toe pad. Um, and so, a, again, yeah, it's not, it's not a type of um, uh, fluid secretion or, or suction kind of thing. Uh, it's a, the, the, the force of a bunch of uh, tiny bristles kind of working together uh, to hold up um, a, a gecko on a wall. Um, and even though they have pretty strong sticking power, uh, these toe pads are very easy to peel off because uh, geckos can kind of flex their toes um, uh, you know, in a quote-unquote double-jointed way. So they can kind of peel their own toe pads away from the surface uh, and kind of only peel away one of those bristles at a time. Um, uh, one by one, and so they don't have to overcome like the entire force of the of the adhesion um, all at once, and so it's very convenient type of thing. Um, some geckos actually not only have these uh, adhesive bristles uh, on their toe pads, but also on the underside of their tail as well. Uh, so basically, yeah, geckos were made to stick to things, um, and geckos. Uh, are not only very diverse in terms of the number of species, but also in terms of the number of different lifestyles and adaptations that they that they have kind of branched out into. Uh, so there is one group of geckos in uh, Australasia uh, that don't have any legs. <laughs> Funnily enough, because we were just talking about how they have these these weird toe pad things. Yep, these guys don't have legs. Uh, so they're they're a group of uh, burrowing geckos called the pygopodids. So they they do have like some remnants of the hind limbs, but you know, no forelimbs. Uh, and so fun functionally, they basically don't have any legs, um, but they, they burrow around in substrate, uh, feeding on various invertebrates and also on other types of lizards. Um, there are types of geckos that are that can glide from tree to tree. Um, there are types of geckos that shoot fluid from their tails, which is a really weird adaptation. Uh, so they have these little glands like along the top of the tail, uh, and when they are threatened, they will actually like shoot this sticky fluid at their predator. And now the fluid is not toxic, it's not poisonous, uh, but apparently it's not, it doesn't taste very good. So, so apparently that puts off predators. Um, 
there are geckos that escape from predators by peeling off their own skin, which is pretty wild. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there, there are these geckos called uh, like fish scale geckos, um, and the scales on these geckos are, are very big and flat. Like they look a lot like fish scales. That's how they get their name, um, and they come off really easily. So you grab onto one of them, they can just kind of squirm free and leave you with a handful of scales, um, and then they they run away kind of pink and naked. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> Pretty wild adaptations in this group of lizards. And so the species that this new study we're going to talk about today um, is the largest gecko known to have existed. Uh, and it's called Delcor's giant gecko. Now, uh, this is a very mysterious type of gecko because it is only known from a single specimen uh, that's been preserved and it's currently held in a museum in France. However, there is basically no information about where it came from or who collected it or when it was collected. Um, based on the way this specimen is preserved, it has been inferred that it has probably been in the museum since at least the 1830s. Um, so quite a long time ago. But beyond that, yeah, we don't know much about the circumstances of how it was collected and where it was collected. Now, how big is, is it exactly? Well, in terms of total length, it's somewhere around 60 centimeters long. So that's about two feet long. Um, and so in the figure on top over here, uh, the this giant gecko is the one on the right. Uh, and the gecko on the left is the largest um, living species of gecko, uh, which is the New Caledonian giant gecko. Now, I say living here uh, because uh, Delcor's giant gecko is thought to probably be extinct, or at least no one has come across a living one, so it's assumed that it, it is extinct. Um, so what can we tell about uh, what this giant lizard was all about anyways? Well, um, when this specimen was first described, um, it was suggested that uh, it was probably a member of the New Zealand genus of geckos uh, called Hoplodactylus. Uh, this was based on its anatomical similarities to that genus. And furthermore, uh, it was also reported somewhat later uh, that it matches descriptions of this large lizard from Maori oral tradition, uh, which the, this, uh, this lizard, this legendary lizard, was called uh, the uh, Kawe Kawe Yao. Um, in terms of its size and its coloration, it does seem to match this large lizard very well. Uh, however, no fossils of Delcor's giant gecko have ever been found on New Zealand, even though we have a pretty decent recent fossil record of the New Zealand vertebrates. So yeah, the, the, that that's a that leaves us with a bit of a mystery. Um, so kind of these indirect lines of evidence seem to suggest that Delcor's giant gecko used to live on New Zealand, um, but we have no remains for, of it from from that region. It, it has also been suggested that it may have come from New Caledonia instead, um, based on similarities to the geckos there. And it's very hard to rule out this possibility, but there was just like no definitive evidence to say either way. And so uh, this new study uh, managed to extract DNA from this only known specimen of Delcor's giant gecko. And so mm -hmm. from there, uh, they were able to perform a study trying to figure out what type of gecko it was. And maybe uh, that will tell us something about its actual origin. So what did they find? Um, so the authors of the, this new paper ran a phylogenetic analysis, including uh, Delcor's giant gecko, uh, as well as a wide range of geckos that seem to be closely related, including both New Zealand species and New Caledonian species. And what they found was that the results of their phylogenetic analysis uh, pretty squarely placed Delcor's giant gecko within a clade of New Caledonian species and not the New mm -hmm. Zealand species. So you can see their phylogeny on the right over here. Uh, so Delcor's giant gecko is shown in green, uh, both in terms of like the kind of schematic sort of silhouette that they have here as well as the, mm -hmm. the branch. Um, and the, the silhouettes are basically showing kind of 
the size disparity between uh, Delcor's giant gecko and other types of gecko, so you can see how much bigger it is than everything else. Um, the genus Hoplodactylus is part of this New Zealand clade that's highlighted in red down below, and you can see that at least as far as these gecko species are concerned, uh, Delcor's giant gecko is not closely related with the New Zealand clade at all, um, and is firmly nested within this New Caledonian clade. So uh, the authors conclude that it is most likely that Delcor's giant gecko came from New Caledonia and not from New Zealand. That being said, uh, it, it is still kind of difficult to rule out um, a New Zealand origin because just from the fact that so many different geckos are found on these oceanic islands, uh, we know geckos are pretty good at getting to, to other islands, um, or pretty good at getting to islands in, in general. Um, and so, strictly speaking, it is not outside the realm of possibility that the ancestors of Delcor's giant gecko could have made it to New Zealand from New Caledonia. Um, that being said, I don't think we have any examples of this actually occurring in the New Caledonian clade. And in fact, the authors point out that um, the members of this clade of geckos, in fact, including both the New Zealand species and the New Caledonian species, so this entire clade that they examined, um, they lack some adaptations that other types of geckos have that help them disperse uh, across you know, these long distances across oceans. Um, for example, some types of geckos have, have these like sticky eggs that can stick to surfaces. Yeah, their, their eggs are sticky too. Um, <laughs> and, and so... In many cases, probably these gecko eggs can be attached to, say, the inside of a tree hollow or inside a log or something, and just gets washed out to sea. And uh, if they're lucky and don't get uh, drowned um, by water, they might make it to an island. And if they hatch, well, <laughs> you have a new population of geckos on, on that island. Uh, but like the clade of geckos that the Delcor's giant gecko belongs to um, does not have the, the sticky eggs. Um, so it is unlikely that this would be a method uh, of dispersal for them. Uh, so all things considered, uh, while this does not demonstrate without a doubt that it did not live on New Zealand, it does strongly support um, a New Caledonian origin instead. Now, since Delcor's giant gecko is not in fact closely related to uh, the New Zealand clade of geckos, uh, well, it can't be classified in the genus Hoplodactylus with them. Um, meanwhile, in terms of its relationship to the New Caledonian geckos, it turns out that based on their analyses at least, Delcor's giant gecko is not like clearly nested within any of the established living genera of um, New Caledonian geckos. Uh, now, for the record, if you're wondering, uh, some of the closest relatives to Delcor's giant gecko recovered by the study um, include the genera Maniaro gecko, Eurydactylodes, um, and Rhacodactylus. Um, now, Rhacodactylus is the genus that includes the New Caledonian giant gecko, the largest living species that's pictured on this slide. Um, so it seems like the Delcor's giant gecko is in pretty good company when it comes to being big. Uh, the, one, one of its closest relatives is among the biggest geckos as well. Um, that being said, uh, the members of Eurydactylodes, um, those guys are a bit quite a bit smaller. Uh, so there, there's a pretty wide range of sizes in, in this group of geckos. Um, and for the record, um, Eurydactylodes includes some of those kind of, um, some of those geckos I mentioned earlier uh, that can shoot fluid from, from their tails at predators. So that's pretty cool. Um, this adaptation appears to have actually evolved multiple times in different geckos. So there, there's also like an Australian clade that does it, for example. Um, so very weird adaptation, especially to have arisen more than once. Um, but in any case, yeah, uh, um, Delcor's John Gecko is part of this pretty uh, remarkable group. Um, now, since it is not um, uh, clearly nested within any of these established genera, uh, the authors decide to name a new genus for Delcor's John Gecko uh, because it, it's not Hoplodactylus, right? Um, so the new genus that they picked for it is Gig Arcanum meaning giant mystery, which I think is a pretty great name for this very mysterious and large gecko. Um, so 
Now, this study, I think, really goes a long way towards clarifying what type of gecko uh, this is and very likely shedding light on its true origins. That being said, it there are still some remaining questions, aren't there? Like, for example, what is the Kawe Kawe uh, of Maori tradition? Um, we do know from the fossil record that there appear to have been large species of hoplodactylus that lived until recently uh, in New Zealand, so maybe it's actually referring to one of those? Who knows? Um, but it is kind of odd that in terms of size and coloration, Delcor's giant gecko, uh, now Gig Arcanum, matches so well with, with those, those uh, descriptions, um, so... Who knows? <laughs> like, uh, may maybe some interesting convergent evolution going on, or you know, who knows? May may maybe maybe it did come from New Zealand, <laughs> like, as mentioned earlier. Um, but uh, ho hopefully, at some point, we manage to find um, more specimens to kind of tease this out. But uh, knowing that it more likely comes from New Caledonia, at least, gives us a place to look. Uh, speaking of which, uh, I mentioned earlier that. Uh, Delcor's giant gecko is presumed extinct because no one has been able to find a living one. But of course, we didn't know where to look, right? Um, <laughs> so, is there a possibility that it could still be alive? Well, I guess that's an interesting question, isn't it? It would seem that a gecko this big you would expect it to be pretty hard to miss if it was still around. Um, that being said, some of the authors of the paper in interviews have mentioned that you know they, they still hold out hope of a slim possibility that this thing might still be around in New Caledonia, and new species of geckos are described from New Cal Caledonia still, so uh, obviously it has not been um, explored so exhaustively that we found every gecko there is to find there. Um, so if this thing is always hiding up in the treetops or something, then technically, in theory, maybe it's still out there. Um, certainly, um, you know, co compared to some other cases, I, I, I would say that there is a higher chance of this thing still existing um, than, than some other species people claim are still around um uh but i i am personally not holding my breath um still uh it is really fantastic that we have gotten so much new insight from the study on this giant mystery <laughs> what do you think <laughs> well um i guess my initial questions would be if there's a chance that this gecko is still around well my question is like how how dense is the human population in New Caledonia? Like, if there's enough people living on that island, and I know there have been people there for at least, you know, 3,500 years, mm -hmm. um, chances are they probably would have seen one right. at some point. <laughs> I mean, not necessarily, like, seen one to, like, alert herpetologists, but, I mean, that would be my first question. Mm -hmm. um, Suppose it's rather like the Tasmania thing with the thylacine, right? right? It's like, I mean, yeah, a lot of Tasmania is, like, you know, mountainous and glaciery, but there's still a sizable amount of people on there that mm -hmm. will probably notice if one of these things was still running around. <laughs> I mean, considering a gecko that's seemingly larger than a house cat, um, <laughs> you know, that, that would be hard to miss, I would think. Um, but yeah, I mean, then again, stranger things have happened. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a funny paper for me um, because it does seem kind of like one of those... Um, kind of fun unexpected mysteries isn't it mm -hmm. like we don't know where this lizard came from let's do some dna and plug it in with all the other geckos that we can find and then see maybe if we can get a clue where it is <laughs> and mm -hmm. to see them kind of recover it with this new caledonian clade um it's exciting i give them props um i would not be surprised if that specimen turned out to be the only one that like dispersed from New Caledonia to New Zealand and it just, just happened to be the one that scientists found. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be kind of hilarious, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, it certainly would be nice. I mean, that would be one part of our fauna that has still clung on after all this time. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah, so like there, there are no, there are no fossils of 
this animal are there? Nope. <laughs> Anywhere. Nope. It, like, all we have is just this, I guess, rather crudely stuffed specimen. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, that's been around for a while. Wow. That's remarkable. I will say I love the, um, I love the diagram here. <laughs> how they have the, um, the geologic time synced in with the, I guess, what is that, the lengths? Of each of these. Uh, yeah, that's right. The body sizes. Yep. <laughs> that's really clever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I really like that. that. That's a good approach. Um, it's funny that you pick this paper <laughs> to talk about, considering that, like, as of the time of recording, I just started reading uh, another classic book, uh, Tim Flannery's The Future Eaters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and once you know it, he goes into quite a bit about New Caledonia and New Zealand and its wildlife. Um, it certainly, gives me, it certainly has given me some perspective as I've been listening to you talk about these different animals here. Um, because as I understand it, at least according to the book, um, New Caledonia and New Zealand are quite different territories in regards to, you know, the herptals, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, New Caledonia has had kind of a, you know, a tropical position for a long period of time. It's above the Tropic of Capricorn. Um, it's got, you know, fairly acidic soils. Um, it has, you know, sizable forests. And the climate is really good for reptiles in it that geckos have diversified so much that some of these larger forms were probably the ecological equivalent of, like, monkeys or mm -hmm. possums right. in terms of what they were doing. Whereas you get something like New Zealand, where reptiles have not had the best success as they had on New Caledonia. Like, clearly, like, there are reptiles there. I mean, uh, not including birds, of course, um, as we have, you know, the New Zealand clade of geckos here. But, like, the frog diversity on New Zealand is fairly high mm. and substantial. And that seems to be because New Zealand, of course, is, is you know, closer to the South Pole. Um, it was hit by glaciers frequently during the Pleistocene. Um, so even though it is larger and more biologically productive in certain respects, I guess it's, it's one of those environments that reptiles, you know, haven't really had the fortune of expansion like they have with New Caledonia. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like the reptilian birds, that's, a, that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, regarding like the lizards and things. Right. Because um, so of course, uh, New Caledonia was also home to the, the giant horned turtles the 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 Mio Lanyids and um the 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 Miko Sukine crocodilians mm -hmm. or crocodilomorphs um, I forget which one is which um uh, where they go in the tree um so like New Caledonia was like a reptile haven whereas you know New Zealand um was kind of more like the the frog and and, and bird haven more right. or less um so it's interesting that in my head as you're discussing these geckos um because yeah i guess i guess if i had to put my money on it without the benefit of this study if you had come up to me and asked me like hey do you think this giant gecko was from new caledonia or new zealand <laughs> um i would probably have put my bets on new caledonia mm -hmm. just in terms of like the specializations that have been recorded on that island for what geckos were doing um so it's a really remarkable animal um Gosh, I sure hope that we would find more specimens. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's got to be an absolutely brilliant stroke of luck that they were able to get DNA from this in the first yeah. place. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so you said that this was from a preserved specimen um, at a museum. Yeah. Uh, was this like, was it, because I'm looking at the, the figure here. Is, is that a stuffed specimen? Or was yeah. that in like a jar? I, yeah, it has been stuffed. Like the, the insides have, have been removed and such. Yeah, and I know uh, stuffing non-avian reptiles is kind of a uh, an interesting um, process. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so like, I mean, I I would imagine like the storage where it was was pretty decent mm. um, for it to have kind of kept its genetic information like that after all this time without having to succumb to extreme heat or cold. Right. If you know what I mean. Yep. Um, so that's really good. Um, and now we have that data and, uh, yeah, it would be nice to kind of know more of what this animal was doing. Um, cause 
you know, maybe it was acting like some of these other giant geckos, or maybe doing something completely different. Mm -hmm. um, again, with New Caledonia, um, <laughs> it's kind of hard to tell. Yeah, exactly. Um, could have been doing something completely different from all the others. Um, yeah. No, this is great. This is a really great paper. Um, and I'm pleased to see that even if it's still a bit of a mystery, like at least some of it has been uncovered. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think that's still a win in my book. Absolutely. <laughs> So yay, welcome to the world, uh, Giger Kenum. <laughs> kind of fun. I can picture the, the uh, Giga from Doraemon. Drom is one of these little geckos. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, that's all I have to comment on this. Mm. Um, if there's anything else you wanted to add, um, we can close out to our ending matter. Sounds good. Yeah, so uh, those were our news stories. We want to thank you all again for joining us. Um, of course, we are on Patreon. If you are interested <laughs> in supporting us, um, we are patreon.com forward slash time and clades. We accept any and all monetary donations as well as our tier system. Um, and your contributions would help us continue this series and develop new projects and expansions. Um, of course, we are very fortunate to have a couple of patrons already. And uh, they are at a tier where they are owed shout outs. So we want to give a big hug and thanks to Paul, Denver, Frankish, and Val Denunzio for their um, support. We really appreciate it. And uh, moving on to our other acknowledgments, of course, we want to thank our good friends, Henry and Alicia, for their contributions to this series. Henry is responsible for the wonderful music that opens each episode. And Alicia is responsible for the color scheme of Albert's Alvarosaur avatar, which is always a, a cheerful fellow. <laughs> um, and of course, moving on, um, we are on Twitter, even though Twitter seems to be struggling right now with an <laughs> identity crisis. Um, yep. Good God, I, 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 was at, I was in Florida when the, the latest Elon update hit and then subsequently went away. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, at the very least, uh, we will stay with the ship until it fully sinks and decomposes at the bottom of the ocean floor. <laughs> so if you want to, to fo follow us, uh, we are at Time and Clades, um, where we usually just post episodes um, that we've uploaded on our YouTube page, which is where you're probably watching us right now. So we are through Time and Clades. Um, if you want to give a like and subscribe, we certainly would appreciate it if you want to. Um, now, if you have any questions for us about the topics and papers and books we talked about today, um, or just any question in general, um, there are three ways you can contact us. You can leave us a YouTube comment. You can send an email to us, timeandclades at gmail.com, or you can tweet at us. Um, but right now, it seems like YouTube seems to be our main source of questions and comments, so we always appreciate everything that we get. Um, now, if you want to read the papers that we've talked about or check out links to buy the books or watch the show, so check out the Tarpoon Springs Aquarium, um, all those references are below in the description, or you can check them out, um, and we will list them all accordingly. And uh, with that, that is it for our show. Um, in terms of what's coming up next, well, um, you can almost certainly be guaranteed uh, more news episodes, um, whether that will cover just July or the next couple of, of months, so I guess will depend on what we have going on. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that I know you all can count on is that we are approaching that time of the year where the next update special for my series, Humanity of Prologue, is usually due to come out. Uh, I've tried to time it with the uh, premiere of the original series. <laughs> um, and so I have been hard at work looking at all kinds of papers to include. And there is certainly quite a lot um, <laughs> that I would like to cover. Um, so it's going to be a very interesting episode. Um, I have some formatting ideas I want to try, and uh, I hope it'll uh, have a good reception. Um, but we know that uh, you'll be joining us for when that happens, and so we look forward to seeing you then. Um, but until next time, thank you all for joining us, and we hope you have an awesome day. Yeah, take care, everybody.